Call to order the um, regular council meeting for uh, Tuesday, uh, June 1st. And um, we acknowledge we are conducting our business today on the unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people. As a council, we recognize the importance of doing our best to build respectful relationships that contribute to stewarding the land and waters in our community with integrity and consideration for future generations. And I would also like to uh, make note that uh, to honor and uh, memorialize the uh, uh, tragic events um, at the uh, residential school site in Cam. The Canadian flag on the Lake Country Municipal Hall has been lowered to half mass to express our collective sense of deep sorrow and loss that is shared across Canada following the discovery of undocumented remains of 215 children at the former residential school in Kamloops. It is difficult to find adequate words to express the deep mourning we feel for the tragic, heartbreaking losses and intergenerational effects of the residential school system. The lowering of the flag is done to honor the children that were sent to residential schools, those who died, and the families and changed forever as a result of what took place in those institutions. As a past professor of archaeology. I support the indigenous leaders and experts in BC that are calling for control and protection of sites of former residential schools so full investigations can be done in a similar manner that uh, to the work done by the Kamloops and Swashemek First Nation using ground pen penetrating radar technology. News of the discoveries has had a profound effect on countless individuals and families, and we share the grief and hope that the truth of coming uh, coming to light will aid in the healing process and uh, our um, really indeed heartfelt concern and, and sorrow. I'd, I'd like to ask for a minute of silence and respect for the gone. Again, thank you for the respect and we'll carry on our business and uh, thoughts, Councillor Scarrow. I wonder, sir, if it would be appropriate uh, to address a letter to the OKIB Council, um, Chief Byron, from yourself expressing those exact words. We can, Councillor Arlen. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would I would agree with that, but I also think that we should we should try to reach out to our neighbors and partners, OKIB, not just expressing our sorrow, but trying to do see where we can participate to do something real, and not just you know I mean I, the words are great and I, they're all heartfelt I'm I'm sure and I, I certainly <clears throat> think that many of our citizens you know be they Aboriginal or not are feeling this very, very deeply. I mean, these are children for great yeah. sakes. And so um, I think reaching out to them in a more, you know, and you know, not just that statement is if we could reach out to try to do something more meaningful and, and 
we can't tell them what we think is meaningful. No. We need to rely on them to, to interact with us so that we can help them. Well, I, was, yeah. um, I was going to raise it later under council mm -hmm. items, but uh, I can share now that at the regional board level, and we have budgeted at the regional board to have an um, interaction with the indigenous uh, group, and we have a um, council from uh, um, the uh, West Bank First Nation that sits at the table uh, in a non-voting capacity, but uh, Jordan Coble, who does a really good job of, of keeping us aware of indigenous affairs. And there is a committee of the chair of uh, regional district with the uh, West Bank First Nations and uh, regional regional district uh, expertise to um, put together uh, a, a statement of support and concern. And I think we should do that as at the regional level because it includes all of the, our partners in the Okanagan. And uh, so, um, but certainly I'm not adverse to our, I have personal experience with a lot of the First Nations people having taught anthropology and archaeology, taught the Indian Act and, and the devastating aspects of residential schools. So I'm familiar with a number of up and down the valley. So I think uh, it, we, the more, more we can include, uh, the uh, a better it can be. Councillor Sko? I just think that's fine to do that at the regional level, but uh, include what Councillor Ireland has suggested, which is the second part of the letter could be a request from the OKIB to supply us with some thoughts yeah. and ideas. From ourselves as Lake Country and that. Uh, yeah, it, yeah as there are. Bit, right. There are partners in this area. There are right. neighbors. Um, yeah, we have their the, kids and our kids interact, and and uh, we have the protocol agreements. We need to do the neighbors. best that we can yeah. for our neighbors. We'll do, and we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, yes, that's the next item. And Councillor Scarrell's moving. Councillor Reed second, and. Uh, those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And adoption of uh, special council minutes of May 11. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Scarrow, errors or omissions? Hearing none. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And the regular council meeting minutes of May 18. Councillor Scarrow, Councillor Arlen, errors or omissions? Hearing none. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And special council meeting minutes of May 25. Councillor Gamble and Councillor Scarrow, errors or omissions? None. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you just heard my report from the regional district <laughs> that uh, we're dealing with it. And uh, uh, announcement the only announcement that there is apart from uh, our concern with the uh, uh, residential school issue is that there is a public opportunity for our liquid waste management plan and uh, uh, visit lex, let's talk dot late country dot bc dot ca to complete the uh, liquid waste management plan survey open until june 8th so community's input is essential Extremely important in helping decide the long term solution um, for liquid waste disposal. So, anybody that uh, has something to comment on with regard to our sewer servicing, then um, get on to Let's Talk. And next is the uh, Bylaws following public hearing. Official community plan amendment. Who's doing that? So that one should be Corey. Oh, here she comes. There she is. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Um, I didn't intend to provide a presentation here, just a, a bit of a reminder in terms of uh, next steps. So we had the public hearing, and so now it's time to consider third reading of the bylaws so that we can send them off to the Ministry of Transportation and Highways for uh, their approval. Councillor McKenzie. I'll move it. Councillor Scarrow, second. Any further discussion? Okay. Those in favour? Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. And next up. Oh, public public comment. Anybody phone in? Second time of asking. <laughs> Third time of asking. It takes 30 seconds to <laughs> get through to us. But uh, hearing none, then we'll go on to uh, we. Uh, Councillor Reed asked if we switched, but we came to a corporate decision that uh, it's better to have the public involved early than late. And so that's uh, development related applications for public comment. Councillor, oh no, not Councillor, Planner. <laughs> you ready for the um, number nine development permit? Yes, I am. Just checking. Um, can you see my presentation now? Not yet. Yes, yeah. now, we can. now we can. There we go. Just a little bit of a lag. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's a lot of content here this evening, so I'm going to try to um, stick close to my script. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll have explained several things and then uh, following my presentation, um, both the district engineer and I will be available to answer your questions. So first off, this is development permit 2020 028 and development variance permit 2020 These respond to the Lake Stone master plan from 2012 as amended. Um, it guides the overall development in this development permit and subdivision address the details of the next phase, which is, of course, the summit phase. Where necessary, development variance permits are requested to address site specific challenges encountered, and there are a few in this particular subdivision. So the development permit was first considered by Council on April 6th and Council directed staff via resolution 2104058 to address several matters prior to returning the permit application to Council for further consideration, including bringing the development variance permit for concurrent consideration. Oh, I get my cursor to where I can find it here. Bear with me, sorry. <clears throat> okay, I seem to have managed to get myself to a place where my <laughs> keyboard is not, and my mouse aren't yeah, talking we, to me. We can see. Uh, yes, but I can't advance the slide. I see. Mom, you see the cat? <laughs> Can you get that off? Try making it up. Oh. Um, we'll go there. I apologize. Uh, having just a little bit of difficulty here with the, the screen. Yeah, it seems to have. Maybe try going back out, back into it. I don't know if I can do that. It just literally is not. Oh. Miss. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I can tell you that uh, Teams did just do a major update today, so there is a whole bunch of new options and <laughs> new things going on with the system. Uh, so, Corey, it's <laughs> not you. Ah. 
OK, so I started trying. Thank you for, for that, Raina. I started trying uh, random things and found something that worked. So we'll go with that. Tamara had come and tried to rescue me. I, I do apologize. OK, so of approximately the 500 and or pardon me, 105 hectares of the Lake Stone neighborhood, the summit phase involves uh, a 54.8 acre or 22.1 hectare portion at the northwest portion of the site. This will be accessed by an extension of Beacon Hill Drive. So tonight, Council is being asked to consider each of the development permit for hillside, GHG reduction and resource conservation, stability erosion and drainage hazard, natural environment and wildland fire hazard, as well as the development variance permit to vary provisions of the zoning bylaw for retaining wall height and the subdivision development servicing bylaw in order to allow land clearing and preliminary site grading with the understanding that a certificate, certificate to commence construction will be required prior to uh, works and services being installed. This is proposed uh, to be a 57 lot um, subdivision and the essential questions is to determine whether the development as proposed meets the established guidelines and the requested variances are an appropriate response to site conditions. The conceptual layout and design were influenced by the roads and servicing requirements and balanced with the findings from the qualified environmental professionals field survey and environmentally sensitive area analysis. This will be the last phase to develop without a second primary access route from the south and east. The application submission included a project description rationale for each of the development permit, which is uh, attachment A, and development variance permit as attachment B to the council report. Attachment C1 contains the development permit area checklists submitted by the applicant to complement the information provided in the first two attachments and to demonstrate further how the proposal respects the applicable official community plan development permit area guidelines, including additional explanatory materials submitted in response to Council's questions and comments at the April 6 meeting in C2. DP 2020-28 proposes works that include clearing, grubbing, and earthworks of an area of approximately 22 acres, as I mentioned, to create those 57 residential lots, making way for the construction of roadways, uh, including a major collector road and access to the reservoir uh, close to the summit. The proving officer has a concurrent subdivision application under review and uh, that diagram is shown here um, is diagram one. I will note that um, the layout of the proposed summit phase changed slightly from the original um, plan shown in the master plan itself. That area shown in pink where I've highlighted uh, with the red circle there um, shows the lots that are no longer being contemplated as part of, of this phase. They, they have dropped away given the new information that was available um, with, the, with the LIDAR data. It was necessary to uh, amend, amend the plan. So here's just a, a closer up version of that. So again, the pink area, that's the lots that have dropped off. The black lines that you see there are um, the proposed retaining walls, which will be addressed as part of the development variance permit. This is just a closer up version of, um, of the layout with that uh, hairpin turn. And you'll see there's a, a, a black box just uh, near the center top of the screen there. That's the uh, proposed water reservoir. So just wanted to provide a little closer up image of that. So. Let's talk now about the development permit itself. So um, I have listed the development permit areas that are applicable. In fact, those development permit areas, um, with the exception of the GHG and the wildfire hazard, um, generally are, are very, affect very small portions of the site. The uh, OCP designation is urban residential. Zoning forces the DC3 direct control lakes, uh, lakeshore Lake Stone, pardon me, um, zone, and um, 
Essentially, this report for the development permit addresses, as I've, I've mentioned, the land clearing and the preliminary site greeting. And the final engineering design may trigger refinements to these. Uh, these will be uh, addressed through implementation of the subdivision development servicing bylaw requirements as part of the subdivision process. However, proceeding on the basis of this conceptual layout, um, we have uh, a lot of information before us for your consideration. So here you see uh, the red hatched area is a very small portion of uh, the summit phase that is affected by the stability hazard development permit area. Schedule A to the permit contains the drainage review prepared by Beacon Geotechnical with respect to the impact of site grading on, an, on that existing uh, natural drainage channel. The review indicates the encroachment is limited and that the risk from a geotechnical perspective to the natural environment can be minimized by using best practices and will be within acceptable levels. Schedule B to the permit contains the drainage corridor development permit engineering assessment prepared by Alpine consultants to address potential disruption to the natural drainage flow and associated corridors. It provides confirmation that the proposed subdivision layout and engineering design has been coordinated by the, with the qualified environmental professional and the geotechnical engineer. So you see uh, at the top uh, right hand corner of uh, the map there, the area that is impacted by this uh, drainage corridor development permit area. Attachment D includes the hillside uh, DP original ground drawing. Just to give you an idea, you can see very clearly by these contour lines where, where the summit um, is and hence the name for this particular phase. The hillside uh, DP proposed ground drawing D4 shows the overall grading plan proposed for the site to be included as part of the subdivision works. The DPN schedules contained in attachment E outlines the details of how the proposed development addresses site conditions. Site development must follow the recommendations contained in the technical reports contained in the schedules attached to informing part of that permit, specifically with respect to drainage, environmental and wildfire mitigation. While each of the technical DPs could have been considered by the Director of Planning and Development, a single comprehensive DP has been presented for Council's consideration. Hence the bulk of uh, the package uh, because of the inclusion of the um, environmental report, which is, is, is very bulky. Nevertheless, this is the uh, site grading in the vicinity of lot 57 from the geotechnical report as contained in Schedule A of the development permit. You can see here um, there is some considerable grading in the area of lot 57 um, and just to just along the edge of the road there to accomplish this layout. Schedule C to the permit contains the environmental assessment and mitigation plan prepared by Ecoscape environmental consultants specifically for the summit phase. The report format and content are consistent with regional best practices and includes a thorough review of the proposed works, an environmental assessment, an impact assessment and recommendations for mitigation measures, environmental monitoring, restoration and performance bonding, and confirms the proposed division layout has been informed by the findings of Ecoscape's field survey and environmental sensitive area analysis. Existing terrestrial riparian um, wetland resource values are identified and um, potential rare and or endangered species and habitats have been assessed. Recommendations to maintain the natural integrity of the existing ecological communities through sensitive design are provided throughout the report and summarized in section four mitigation measures. This is figure five from the environmental assessment and mitigation plan for the summit phase attached to schedule C of the development permit. This plan shows the limits of disturbance area with respect to the extent of both cuts, which are the red line and fills shown by the green line overlaid on the environmentally sensitive areas, the ESA 2 and 3. The QEP advises that the project will result in a loss of 17% of ESA 2, which is a high 
uh, value area and 23% of ESA 3, which is more moderate within the project development area. Maintaining the balance of the limits of disturbance will be particularly important in this regard. If it is necessary to encroach on area, any area outside of the defined area, an amendment to the development permit will be required. Schedule D contains mosaic force management's wildfire threat assessment conducted on October 31st, 2020 and describes prescriptive measures for the area identified as open area and parks, lands that will be in due course uh, dedicated to the district on subdivision and the map is contained in the report. Schedule E contains a, a second report from Mosaic Forest Management confirming wildfire mitigation has been completed on several lots previously during work conducted as part of phase five. An environmental monitor must be retained by the developer and be present on site during construction activities to guide and document compliance with best management practices. Mitigation measures and all other recommendations contained in the environmental report, section 411, at their own cost. No formalized landscape plan is required as the extent of development is limited to clearing for lot and road construction within the defined limits disturbance area. Uh, you can see that in Schedule C, Appendix 2. The primary concern for restoration involves returning exposed slopes back to their natural state by hydroseeding the cotton fill slopes with grass seed composed of 100% natural grasses and approved by the QEP conducting the monitoring prior to implementation. A substantial portion of the summit phase will be provided to the district as parks, open space, which will accommodate walking trails, and a water reservoir near the summit. So all of that area that is shown green on this map are areas that will remain in their natural state. Moving on now, to, whoops, sorry. Moving on to the development variance permit. Attachment F to the report contains the variance permit, which promote, proposes variance to both the zoning bylaw and the subdivision development services bylaw. The zoning bylaw variance request is to vary the minimum height of retaining walls stipulated in section 8.5 fences and retaining walls subsection 0.8 on selected lots. It's important to be clear that variances address the highest point at each wall. The height of individual walls will respond to the terrain and will each vary in height up to the maximum height permitted. Any variances to be decided by council will need to be approved prior to the approval of the final subdivision plans by the approval approving officer. Detailed design will confirm the extent of the proposed retaining walls. It's expected that the proposed walls be consistent with those constructed in previous phases to respond to the challenging topography. If these variances are not approved, the developer will be required to propose new subdivision layout that respects the bylaw regulations. This photo demonstrates the existing standard for retaining walls built in previous phases at Lakestone. It is a little bit hard to spot, and so I have uh, provided some circles on the map to make it a little easier to see. Um, the color of the wall blending quite well with the color of the slope. Table A and Schedule A of the permit describe the walls in more detail. The areas of retaining are shown in the overall plan highlighted here. So um, those dark black lines that we saw on the map earlier. And, and then in Table uh, A, the description of the individual lots that are impacted and the maximum height uh, anticipated for those, for those walls. I provided these not so much to give uh, a detailed discussion, but just to highlight the fact that there are in fact um, additional information provided in, in the package and attached to the development permit describing uh, what those walls might look like as they respond to the terrain in cross section. So those were those diagrams. So as council expressed a desire to see a complete picture, district staff feel it would be most appropriate for council to consider all of the variances requested to the subdivision development servicing bylaw as a single comprehensive package, regardless of the authority for some to be decided by the district engineer. 
These variances are being requested by the applicant in advance of the district engineering department receiving a complete design submission, which is required for review, approval, and issuance of the certificate to commence construction. If these variances are not approved, the developer will be required to propose a new subdivision layout, as I mentioned, the respects of the bylaw regulations. The district's engineering staff have reviewed the technical information submitted and have determined that there is insufficient information to support the above variances at this stage. One thing that we did note this afternoon is the uh, subdivision and development servicing bylaw schedule Q design and construction in hillside development areas contains specifications specifically designed for addressing the challenges of constructing on hillsides. As such, any variance request to schedule Q is requesting a change to the standards that already compensate for these conditions. So I would note to council that um, there are two changes here. Subsection A should read section Q27 table Q1 hillside development standards. The remainder of um, the statement uh, is, is remains true. It's just rather than varying the standard standards, uh, we're varying the hillside standards. Um, it makes no difference to to the variance requested, but for clarity, well, we will be making that correction to the text. So the proposed geometry, um, according to the engineering department, extends um, the same standard uh, constructed in phase uh, 5.1 into the summit phase. So that variance to the hillside development standards would allow the extension of the existing modified HS1 hillside standard cross section along Beacon Hill Drive, including a wider right of way and pavement widths and a variance of the curb standard and barrier to roll over curb where the road fronts are residential lots. The applicant advises that all design efforts have been made to minimize the requested variances and the proposed road geometry is consistent with works constructed in previous phases. Further, the standard implements what they consider the best fit combination of curb and gutter, not necessarily something that is um, completely agreed to at, at this point with our, our engineering staff. Nonetheless, uh, point B uh, also needs uh, a slight modification rather than section G16 design speeds. Um, we're varying table Q1 hillside development standards. Uh, it remains the design speed for a hillside collector being varied from 50 to 30 kilometers an hour. So um, uh, unless detailed design eliminates the anticipated variances, um, the variance permit needs to include this variance to, to design speed uh, to accommodate the hairpin turn, which you saw in the earlier diagrams. Um, it essentially reduces the design speed over a section of approximately 240 meters of the proposed road, as highlighted yellow here. The design speed of a road is used for establishing the appropriate geomatic geometric design elements such as grade, super elevation and site distance. The proposed design speed will result in a series of tighter rad radius corners uh, through this section of the road. The applicant advises that reduction in design speeding is being proposed the localized segment. Oh, too far. Localized segment of Beacon Hill Drive allowing for the optimization of the road alignment uh, while also minimizing uh, rock cut slopes. So the, the two things are very much related. The area of speed reduction variance, as I said, is shown highlighted yellow here. Subsequent to receiving comments from the district's uh, engineer, the applicant engaged in an independent prof professional transportation engineer to conduct a peer review of the proposed road design and rationale. It is provided in attachment J to the report. The report concludes that Beacon Hill Drive would be appropriately classified as a local road and that the proposed reduced speed is appropriate in the circumstances. Again, um, there's not necessarily agreement on this particular point at this point. Uh, at this point um, further information will be required to verify that. The report recommends barrier curb and signage be installed in specific locations, and so that, that will be taken into consideration. 
The DP and DVP are being advanced for council consideration now um, as a request from the applicant, just to be very clear. So the third uh, variance to subdivision and development servicing bylaw requested by the applicant is for identified segments of the sanitary and storm mains. Um, the bylaw only specifies the minimum depth for storm drainage systems, so no variance is required to accommodate the proposed storm main design. However, bylaw section K83 specifies a maximum depth of cover for sanitary sewer systems. As such, a variance for those segments of sanitary sewer main will be required as specified in the DVP. And the applicant advises that the localized segments where the maximum 4.5 meters is exceeded occur in the middle of pipe segments and are not in the vicinity of manholes. As such, the additional depth of cover allows for infrastructure to be optimized. One less manhole is required and the locations are detailed in Schedule C of the development variance permit. Essentially, this map shows uh, the highlighted portion of the road where the depth of cover specified will be exceeded. The variance to the sewer appears to be directly linked to the retaining wall variance and to the desire to have lots with lockout basements at these locations. Therefore, the sewer variance will be impacted directly by the retaining wall variance. Engineering cannot support this variance as proposed due to insufficient information at this point to determine the full impact. It's duly recognized that final engineering design may trigger refinements to site grading. These will be addressed through the implementation of the subdivision development servicing bylaw requirements as part of the subdivision process, as long as there is no need to go beyond the variances considered in uh, the development variance permit, um, they would be able to proceed. If there are changes, uh, we would need to come back to council um, for additional uh, conversation. So there were some additional issues that were identified previously by Council. First of these is drainage concerns. So a Council specifically requested the applicant to address how drainage concerns would be resolved and how the solution integrates with the greater Lakestone neighbourhood. The applicant advises that all drainage issues are covered in the 50 and 100% engineering design drawings provided to the engineering department. The drawings include a conceptual storm drainage system as well as the erosion and sediment control plan contained in attachment G to this report. The district's engineering staff have reviewed the technical information submitted and have determined that there is insufficient information to support the storm drainage design as well as the erosion and sediment control plan. Specifically, the drainage outfall on Okanagan Center Road West remains unsolved. District staff continue to work with the developer towards resolving this issue. Council requested the applicant to clarify the anticipated timelines for road connections, especially with respect to emergency egress from the neighbourhood in the event of wildfire and information about the anticipated travel distances when the connections are complete. The applicant has confirmed purchased property north of Sage Glen for the purpose of constructing a second primary access to the neighbourhood from the east. The next phase to be developed after the summit phase will be the East Ridge phase, which will utilise this new access. The lowest lot in the summit phase will have to travel 410 metres to the long road exit um, in the case of an emergency. The highest lot in the summit phase will have to travel 1.3 kilometres to the long road exit. A similar distance will be maintained to the west when the connection of Beacon Hill Drive is complete. Council expressed some concern about the timing and extent of tree removal that would be required to accommodate the proposed road alignment and subdivision of residential lots, in particular, the removal of two significant trees, as shown on Figure 5 of the Environmental Report, attached to and forming part of the development permit. In response, the applicant engaged the qualified environmental professional to prepare a follow-up report addressing expressed concerns. A technical memorandum from the QEP dated April 27th is attached to Schedule F to the DP to address the tree removal protocol for the summit phase more specifically and address restorative measures to be implemented following completion of the works. Beyond the terms and conditions of the development permit, with respect to timing for land clearing activities, the applicant has confirmed that tree removal will only take place within the approved limits of disturbance 
where possible, trees will be retained on the building lots when site grading permits. The extent of the tree removal on individual lots will be determined during construction. It's anticipated that some trees will remain at the rear of some residential lots. Council was provided a brief introduction to the proposed 2021 master plan revisions at a strategy session on May 11th, 2021. Uh, the document was subsequently made available for detailed review and comment with the understanding that Section 3, Infrastructure Planning and Design, would be subject to further amendment based on work currently underway to resolve the remaining issues. McDonald Communities Limited provided additional information to Council on May 12th uh, in an effort to address some of the expressed concerns. And for transparency, this letter is contained in Attachment K to this report. Also, the Lake Stone Master Plan has provided its information to Council and the public in item 14.1 of this evening's agenda. So we have uh, some options for Council's consideration, approval of the development permit would allow the applicant to proceed with the land clearing and preliminary site grading in preparation for the subdivision uh, of the summit uh, phase. Um, in accordance with preliminary layout review issue, which will be issued by the approving officer. Approval, oh, pardon me, two pages the same. Uh, option B is that both the development permit and development variance permit be denied. Option C is that they be deferred pending additional information as identified by council. And option D is uh, that they be referred back to staff to work with the applicant to revise the site plan and propose variances if um, there are issues identified by council. Option E is that any combination of the above can, can be approved. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my comments this evening. I'll Thank try you. to see if I can get out. Any questions for any comments? Anybody want to take it on? I got Councillor Gamble and then I'll get you, Councillor Scarrow. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thanks very much uh, for that report. That was uh, definitely uh, an in depth report uh, and um, very significant. Um, Yeah, I'm sorry. Carry on. Thank you. Um, so some some of the concerns that that I have, um, and I would like to hear from staff. Of, I guess the first one is uh, they have continually uh, throughout the report expressed concerns over uh, the drainage, and I would like to hear a little bit more about those concerns. If they could just go into a little more detail about that. Um, that's that's. Maybe I can just mention a couple of them. I'm sure other people have issues as well. Um, and uh, I guess uh, one of the big issues that I have a concern about is the retaining wall height. Um, I know in this community I've driven around and I have always been concerned about excessively high retaining walls. In this, uh, in this uh, application, we are seeing uh, retaining wall heights as high as over 30 feet. Uh, just purely from a, a safety point of view, that that's a big concern to me. So um, I, I do I do have concerns about that. And of course, I think that's also connected to one of the variances regarding um, the extra depth of the sewer line. Um, that's the way I understand it. And some of this is highly technical, so I hope I'm getting it right. Um, but um, the way I understand it, it I feel that those retaining walls are really excessive, um, and you know, uh, it's something that I have a great deal of trouble with. Um, and if staff can explain maybe some of the reasons for having that those heights, um, but it's something that as a community I think that we aren't very keen to see. Um, the other concern that I had was the request for the wider right of way, and that that's another one of the variances um, and, the, uh, and pavement widths. 
but particularly um, where there is this change from uh, what I understand is a barrier curb to change that to a rollover curb. Um, and I'm assuming that's in the areas, and I believe it is in the area of that very sharp um, hairpin turn. Yeah, but you know, what does that do for protection of the drivers? Uh, and, and the other, I guess, connected to that, I did hear um, Corey mention that this is considered to be just a local road. Uh, and yet, looking at the design, it does connect through to the southern end that is proposed, of course, for development. I don't know at what point, but it's in one of the next phases that it'll connect to the southern development. So, uh, and then I'm, I'm assuming that this will also connect to the exit road that takes, uh, you know, the residents out of this area in the case of wildfire or uh, fire concerns. So um, there's some big issues here. And um, I, I also am not hearing definite dates or times on when the exit road is going to be built. In fact, I even read that in the park area, it's approximate. Um, we don't know the exact, it's all approximate. Um, and I have, a, you know, I'm a little concerned about that. I, I like to see, you know, because the, you have the, the, um, um, the sizes of the lots. I would like to know what those sizes are for the parks and that to be dedicated um, to the community. So there's a few things. I, I don't know if you can add to them all, Corey, but maybe if you can't, maybe um, Ms., uh, Director Salmon can answer some of them. Absolutely, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gamble. Um, I'm sure that uh, Director Salmon will be able to answer some of those. I'd like to um, make it known as well. Uh, the engineer, the developers, the engineers are also um, uh, participating in this meeting and are available. Perhaps they might be able to answer some questions if you direct them um, to them. Um, so there are a number of options and I think I'll let Matthew take over at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, uh, Matthew. Yes, thanks, Corey, and uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. So, in terms of the, the drainage, um, without getting into too many specifics, um, generally there's not enough information to uh, address the design, the drainage design at this point, uh, and specifically how the requested variances will impact the functionality of the drainage. Um, and of course, you know, there's still, so the summit phase is the last phase that will be connected to the drainage system that actually outfalls to Okanagan Lake, which is still the uh, the, the subject of some remediation work that is required as well. So there's still that issue to resolve as well, as well which has resulted in, in um, our, our comments on the report. Um, in terms of the, the road classification, uh, in, in the district's uh, mobility master plan and the work we've done, it is actually designated as a minor collector street. Um, so it's not, it's not in the district eyes classified as a local road. Um, the developer has undertaken their own analysis and come on, come to the conclusion that it should be a local road. Um, but we have obviously through Mobility Master Plan have done some comprehensive modelling of the, the community um, transportation network. Um, and we are very confident, uh, you know, in our results and the fact that uh, this road is and should function as a collector. Uh, I think that was all the all the uh, questions. Uh, but, uh, well, and as as a collector road, what what do you what are your limitations? Of what are your what what how, you know, how is that different from a local road? If you could explain that, that would be helpful. Yeah, so essentially, a uh, a, a collector road, um, you know, functions at a uh, a larger volume and capacity. Um, so, you know, a local road would just serve serve a local area of a community, whereas a collector road would then collect from a local road and then transmit that traffic to, you know, um, say an arterial road. Um, so when it comes to the actual technical specifications of a collector, 
obviously the design speeds are generally higher. Um, the the vehicles and the volumes that they, co they accommodate are generally higher also, um, and therefore there's more requirements, especially on a streetscape um, like this one, um, to ensure that the, the safety of those non vehicular uh, users such as pedestrians and cyclists. So regarding that, uh, what I'm trying to understand is the variant, there is a variance related to that uh, which asks for uh, rollover curbs rather than uh, a barrier curb. Can you explain the difference and um, uh, whether or not you feel that's a concern? Yes, yeah, so certainly through your worship. Um, so the, the barrier curbs um, obviously provide um, vertical separation between vehicles and those non vehicle users, those vulnerable users, as we call them. So those on on uh, on the sidewalks, for example, but also they they uh, they provide important um, drainage functionality in terms of the, the gutter and channeling stormwater into the relevant areas also. OK, thank you. OK. Um, you're done. OK, I'm seeing some uh, people questioning what that means. Can you explain that a little bit better? Maybe just go over it one more time. Yeah, certainly. So through your worship, could you just uh, clarify the the ask? I'm not too sure what it is you're asking me to clarify. Well, just to explain um, the concerns about or whether there were concerns, and it sounded like there are, with a rollover curb rather than a, a barrier, because the barrier obviously would appear to be safer. <laughs> yeah, so generally a barrier curb, obviously, as the name suggests, creates that barrier, that, that, that separation. So um, a vertical separation between a sidewalk and a traffic lane for a vehicle. So clearly, you know, if you're going around a sharp bend, for example, and you in a vehicle that is, and you lost control, and you veered off towards the sidewalk, then the barrier curb is there to, to help prevent that vehicle from um, going onto the sidewalk and therefore protect those that are using the sidewalk. Whereas a rollover curb is obviously a, um, a smooth transition with a very gradual step up um, of only a, an inch or so, a couple of inches. Um, and they're easy, you know, they are, as the name again suggests, designed to actually be driven over. Um, and then also the impact on a, on a, uh, a a steep gradient road is the, is when the stormwater is coming down the side of the of the road and and is channeled from the road profile into the into the gutter then the the curb acts as a barrier and keeps the stormwater within that gutter so it can make its way into the the storm system thanks and i guess we have to remember there's winter too to consider okay thank you um councillor scar <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Baker. Thank you, Corey and Matthew, for your presentations. And thank you, Don, for being here. Uh, I, I've been involved in this development for a very long time, uh, a very long time indeed. And long, long time ago, I think around 2004 or six, when the original DP was or developed DC control area was uh, formulated, eh? we as a council previous to that and at that time reaffirmed that this is going to be a place of development and eventually a road's going to go up to Beacon Hill. Those things were decided a long, long time ago and it would be a difficult process to change that decision. So I don't think we're here to do that tonight or to consider that. I think what we're here to consider and do is how, how to best do this, how to best get access to the areas that uh, McDonald Properties wants to develop and uh, I really appreciate Council's diligence, in fact, in talking about an awful lot of the issues that maybe have uh, been passed by in the past. Eh? I share Councillor Gamble's concern about the height of the retaining walls, but over the process and through explanation by McDonald and their people, I understand some of the reasons why some of those walls have to exist. I also understand why McDonald Enterprises is interested in keeping the materials that are used to build those walls consistent. And in my opinion, because we're half done, phase five out of 13, uh, it would be probably quite logical to consider 
using the same materials for the walls of the future. My biggest concern, of course, is for that 30 foot wall that we're talking about. And I really kind of wonder if there's any other way. Uh, I have one question about uh, to Matthew about what uh, uh, going over the maximum overlay on a septic pipe means. Does that mean a crushing effect? And then I would have a couple of questions for Don if he's available to answer. Regarding the road that they plan on building, um, will, will it be adorned with any kind of vegetative trees? Would it, will it be a much prettier road than Osceola turned out to be or the roads up to the lakes? Are we looking for some kind of breakup of the, of, of the concrete, you know, uh, what does Council Brown call it, a heat sink type of thing? So I'm kind of asking about whether, what kind of uh, aesthetics are going to go along with the streetscape? And the second question I have for Don or maybe Matthew is in regard to uh, another development that happened to the north of us, McKinley Beach is what I'm speaking of. Eh? They have a hairpin corner cut into the rock that uh, leaks. It really leaks badly in the wintertime. And then as a matter of fact, that hairpin corner becomes a really good skating rink and cars crash into the rock wall. I'm concerned that some of these deep cuts, not necessarily on the hairpin, but might, might expose uh, unexpected water. Uh, as we're seeing throughout the valley, especially on Pelmwash, there's a lot of water comes out of rock and in the wintertime it turns to ice. So could Don or Matthew address some of those? So uh, for your worship, maybe I, I'll go first and uh, um, and try and address uh, Councillor Scarrow's questions there. So, um, so the uh, the one about retaining wall. So you know, good retaining wall design um, incorporates drainage as well, which will be um, tackled through the subdivision and development servicing process once we uh, receive that that application and that 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 complete uh, design package. Um, and uh, you know, there are industries best practices and proven designs for dealing with the, those drainage matters. So um, personally, I don't see that being a, a huge issue at this stage as, as long as those design standards are, are met and followed. Um, you'll have to forgive me. Um, I've forgotten the first question there. Scroll by. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're done then. No, I would like uh, Don to address the aesthetics of the street that they have a plan for going up and um, whether or not um, he's going to dress it up for us. You're mute. Can't hear. Somewhere is it? On his end, tech or uh, maybe. <laughs> Can't read it. You got it? Try now, Dan. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. There, you there you go. Okay, okay. there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so to answer your question about the road going up, uh, obviously the alignment is um, is really the only alignment that we can use to get from point A to point B. Um, the good thing about the retaining walls are they're done to the absolute minimum to uh, actually get the road from the top to the bottom. And I think the best thing about these walls, even though they are quite high in, in certain areas, uh, none of the walls are, are directly fronting the road. They're all on private land, on private building lots, and at the rear of the lot. So uh, as you're driving up the summit, you will not see the retaining walls except where they uh, bunt, uh, kind of intersect with the road in a couple of spots. But generally, 95% of the walls are 
invisible as you're driving up the road. Um, there's homes on both sides of the lot, um, most of the way up. And then once you get past the hairpin, um, there's only homes on one side of the road and the opposite side remains totally natural. Uh, so I think the road is going to be quite attractive. But uh, no trees. So, sorry? No trees going up along the sidewalk, like a boulevard? Uh, no, there is no room for the boulevard in this uh, in this road cross section. Uh, there is a small area possibly between uh, the sidewalk and the curb, but that is basically for shallow utilities. Um, and I just want to remind uh, council and, and, and the mayor that this road cross section is the exact same cross section uh, of the road from Tyndall Road all the way up through phase four and five. Uh, and it's this is just a continuation of that exact same cross section. Uh, so I'm I think the thing that I, puzzles me the most is the road that was built in phase four and five was constructed and approved, but did not require a variance of any kind for the cross section. Uh, and I believe there are certain areas within that road as well where the sewers uh, a bit over depth. Uh, as well as the uh, turning radius uh, on a hairpin corner and the design speed in phase four is also e just extremely similar and none of those required variances. So it's puzzling to me why why the variances are required for this phase, but I understand if, that, if that's something that uh, the municipality wants, we would certainly um, oblige them. If I could just speak to one thing regarding the engineering um, uh, portion of this, where basically engineering, uh, it says in the, in the report to council that engineering requires further information. And I would like to just read something to you, if you don't mind, that speaks to that. And I would ask that staff correct me if I'm misinformed uh, in any way, but it'll only take me a quick second to read this if it's okay with mayor and council. Go for it. Yeah. Um, regarding information requiring further information, we don't feel we can provide any more information. I don't think there's anything possible more than we can provide. We have provided a 100% civil design. Uh, there's been peer reviews done by two independent traffic engineers. And most recently, a turning movement analysis was completed by our engineering team, which I am told supports the current design. Um, since the report to council was submitted, uh, the municipal engineering department has met with our engineering team as well as the two independent traffic engineers. As a result of that meeting, our team feels that all agreed that for safety, functionality and operational reasons, it's in everyone's best interest to vary the design speed and the road cross section. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, council is not varying a detailed and specific road cross section tonight, just one that is a continuation of the road already constructed through phase four and five, but which does not meet all the requirements described in the development servicing bylaw. Being that all parties agree that the variances are warranted, Council could approve them this evening with the finer details of the cross-section to be agreed upon and approved by the Municipal Engineering Department through the detailed design review process. Approving the variances this evening will save many hours of staff time to bring this back to Council for a third time while maintaining the Municipal Engineering Department's full control of the ultimate design through the detailed design review process. Uh, so that's kind of our opinion on that, and I, I'll take any other further questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to the list and then I'll get back to the uh, Councillor Reed. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a few questions. <laughs> um, and I did note, um, Don, in response to your um, letter in the report that we have, there is a list of the requirements that the district engineers team are still looking for, and they've kind of listed, I think it's 10 things that are still um, awaiting um, information. So I'm, I'm not sure how that squares with the letter or the 
the email that you just read out. Um, my questions, and maybe this is to either Matthew or Corey or, or to Don, um, looking at the retaining walls, um, we have the heights and I, I dug through the document and found the lengths as well. So we're looking at around about just over 400 metres of retaining wall um, with the highest height of being 10, 10 plus metres that we're considering here as a variance. And I accept Councillor Scarrow's comment well made about the fact that this is in the master plan to have this area developed, but I am incredibly concerned about the, the number of variances that we're putting in and the lack of um, detailed drawings that enable us to receive the best recommendations from staff, which when dealing with technical variances, which is what we're being asked to consider here, is absolutely vital for us as non-technical people to have the benefit of that expertise from two parties, both from yourselves as applicants, but equally on the other side of the, the seesaw, teeter totter, I think they're over here, um, is the, the, um, the view from staff. And at the moment, um, for me, the fact that we're lacking that and they're not able to be in a position to provide it is, is an issue. Um, so my question in relation to the retaining walls, are there any other existing walls in Lakestone of a similar height and length? So eight, eight, uh, sorry, 10 metres high, so, and 100 metres long. I, I, I do believe that there's other instances where there are walls that height in Waterside. I believe that the wall along Tyndall Road uh, in front of the bench lands is close to that height as well as the wall in phase four at the hairpin quarter. Okay, because I, I, yeah, I drove and I, I tried to get it to a few with a tape measure, but I, my, <laughs> I couldn't make it without crap doing an ankle in and I couldn't find anything that was quite as high as the 10 meters. Um, so um, my, my, my note here from the report says that the applicant's response to the councillor's questions and it says that the, nor the walls will not be visible from the road or the home site and I can completely appreciate how you described it when you go up the new road um, you won't see them however looking at the maps provided between lots 50 and 51 they're sandwiched between the the roads are sandwiched between a proposed trailhead and then my question for the lots 30 to 1 to 37 is with a 10 meter high wall that's 200 meters long there when you add the two things together would that be visible from the lake or other areas of the municipality so for example Okanagan Centre Road West or Tyndall. So I, I guess the answer to the wall in front of lots 31 through 37 uh, we did a rendering of what that wall will look like from um, the entrance to the highlands off of Kendall Road, we, that is really the only place that we could find that it would be visible. Um, and then obviously it would be visible from perhaps the trail system and the walls would be visible where they directly intersect with the road in, in those uh, two areas. Uh, but we, we don't believe they're going to be visible anywhere from the benchlands, uh, say from the uh, center plot or the, the courts. Um, we think that's the only spot that'll be visible is from the entrance to the islands. Could you let me know where that rendering is? Because I didn't see it in the report. Uh, Corey, uh, it was part of her presentation. Uh, maybe Corey could throw it up. It's, um, it's nearing the, the beginning of the retaining wall presentation where we did a rendering of that wall. Um, my other question around the retaining walls is that the plans that are on page 330 to 331 show that there's going to be steel slip silt fences and they cut across the trail access between lots 50 and 51. So again, I'm not sure how that's going to be managed in terms of visibility. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Councillor, I, I missed the first part of your question there. Sorry. The, the, the report on the, um, the management of water requires uh, large steel slit fences is how they're described. And the picture, the map shows them cutting across the trailhead between lots 50 and 51. So I'm just confused there as to how that's going to be managed with access to the trailhead with the steel fences and the uh, retaining walls at that height, which are six meters and five meters. 
So the, the drainage corridor is not affected between lots 50 and 51. The drainage corridor issue is just to the south of lot 57. Uh, and then the retaining walls that are on private property on lots 51 and 50 will require fences, but that the fences are for fall protection from those building lots. Um, the trail accesses directly off the street and winds its way down through between those lots uh, and uh, fencing is not an issue there. Uh, and I also see Corey has this rendering up, so. Uh, and you can see in that circle is where uh, the retaining wall is and it's uh, it's rendered at the height that it's designed at. And so that's where that's that's that wall will be visible from this location. OK. Yeah, OK, I guess it would have been nice to see that in the report, but um, it's a little difficult to make out here, but um, OK. Um, the the I, the report makes comments in the from from yourselves as from McDonald um, developments as that the terracing of the walls is possible, but that it would eat into the non developed land. So it says you, we could deliver this by terracing these walls so we didn't um, have the large retaining wall height. However, it would, the comment is made, it cannot be done because unfortunately the district would have to lose that land which is non-developed. Um, but however, reading the new master plan, there was a reference to another phase where four Lakeview lots were held over from development and turned into a park or a viewpoint in return for development elsewhere. So if we were going to look at seeing how we could possibly do this with less variances and less retaining walls, is that something that could be considered in terms of the structure that's being proposed to support this roadway? So I guess the best way to answer that is if we were to terrace these walls, we would have to terrace them going down a steep grade and we would have to chase them down the hill so far uh, to 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 get them terraced to the point where the walls don't require a variance, that would be almost impossible. It would stretch, you know, 50, 100 meters into the green space. Um, you know, as far as let's just say, for example, we eliminated the lots altogether mm -hmm. uh, between lots 31 and 37. That that wall would still so, be. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. To hold up the road. Sorry, they would be need. To, they wouldn't be able to hold up the road. They would still be required to hold up the road, whether the lots are there or not. If you got rid of the lots um, and move the retaining wall up the hill, the, the same height of retaining wall would be required just to support the road. Okay, Evie, and you wouldn't be able to terrace it. No. Okay. It's just too steep. Okay. Um, I echo Councillor Gamble's concerns over the hairpin bend and the lack of the um, the uh, barrier there. Um, I think from, from what we've re read that the requirement that you're asking for is to remove the barrier and place a rollover curb. That's what's in our documentation. Um, I did see an alert from somebody else, somebody else on the call that said that that wasn't the intention. So I'm a little confused about what's being asked for by that. Well, if, if I could speak to the, the curb issue uh, in the meeting that our engineers had with municipal engineering department and the traffic engineers last Friday, we uh, we will go with any curb the district wants. If the if the district wants barrier curbs, uh, we we will certainly comply. And uh, that was discussed during the meeting last Friday. Uh, we agree that there should be a barrier curb in front of lots 31 through 37 on the hairpin corner. Um, and just uh, for reference, there is no sidewalk on that side of the road. The sidewalk is on the inside corner. Uh, so we are more than flexible to put barrier curbs wherever the municipal engineers are requested. And all of this can be uh, accommodated through the design review process. Uh, and, uh, and we're more than willing to accommodate any curbs that the district wants. Fantastic. OK, that's great. That's one thing mm -hmm. off the list, um, which is superb. Um, the road connections, you'd provided additional information that says there's a 1.3 kilometer drive to the Tyndall Road. 
So basically for a period of time, we're creating a 1.3 kilometer cul-de-sac um, with the development with a kind of a steep hairpin, um, which the design, the engineering team does have concerns about for emergency access. So I, it mentions that we'll be uh, at a future phase, there will be a, the, the connection will be made into, into the rest of the network. But how long will that take? How long are we going to have what's described as an interim condition for how many years or months? Well, I, first of all, I, I think it, it's the only way to get through a development this large. Um, and and as strategically as possible. So just, just to round up, we're about halfway through the highlands when we finish the summit phase. And to go any further is, um, uh, is not advisable because those lakes uh, just get longer and longer. So our plan is to start developing from the east side and work back towards it. And that's the, the quickest way to get that road through. Um, and as far as timing goes, um, we, as soon as the master plan is adopted, we have applications ready uh, to be submitted to the municipality for the development of the two eastern phases. So um, we, we're ready to move on those phases immediately as soon as the master plan is approved. So, so how long do you think that will be that before that connection is made? Well, it, it, it could be up to five years, and I and you can't hold me to that, but I'm, I'm suggesting it could be five years. Okay, okay, so I'll have a five, okay, for five years, okay. Um, and my final question, and this is maybe more to, to Matt, Matt um, there was a note about the placement of fill at the top of a natural drainage corridor, and there was a report from Beacon Geotechnical as section E4, and it's a one pager once you take out all the headings and the yours sincerely. And um, it was mostly three, three sentences um, to say that this is this is OK. We're going to do it if it's done to this standard and we trust that this report satisfies your present requirements. I two questions. Um, was there more to the report that was perhaps left out to, to in you know, consideration of council's reading skills um, or length of documentation? Um, and does it satisfy the requirements from the engineering side of things in terms of that statement? Anybody? So three, your worship. Um, I, I can't comment on um, whether that's the entire report or not. Maybe um, Corey could could uh, chirp in on, on that particular point. Um, but in terms of the. The uh, the, the plan, you'll, you'll see from the report that, that actually this, uh, you know, all the reports that are provided at this stage at the DP stage are to support the conceptual plan of the DP. There's there's no technical real technical analysis gone into constructability and and how that construction would take place. That happens at the subsequent stage. Once the applicant makes full application, technical application under the SDS, um, that's when those detailed reports kick in. So there will be a sediment drainage and erosion control report required as to support the detailed design as well. And you'll also, Council will also note that as a, a, a prerequisite to um, any uh, initial site clearing and grubbing taking place under this DP, that um, a sediment erosion and drainage control plan would be required uh, to be reviewed by the engineering department and approved before that activity could take place also. So no work can take place on the site until you and the engineering team have received the documents that are being requested for in this report to provide full information. So, so this DP is covering initial site clearing and grubbing only. Um, and a prerequisite of that activity is a detailed sediment and drainage control plan that would be required to be approved by myself and obviously reviewed by the engineering team prior to that activity taking place. And prior to any, um, as Corey mentioned earlier, prior to any works and services taking place in terms of the infrastructure required to develop this site, that requires the full SDS process to have gone through um, to obtain a certificate to commence construction, which is the official starting point of um, these infrastructure activities, uh, the works and services as we call them, um, to take place. Thank you. OK, I'm going to leave the floor to others because I know there's drainage concerns. Thank you. Um, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thanks for that report, Corey. Um, so 
I, I also uh, uh, echo my fellow councillors' concerns on the on the retaining wall heights. The year, um, that one long one, to put it in, in perspective for those who are in feet, the highest point of the one is 34 feet high and it's 350 feet long. Now, obviously, 34 feet is the highest point, so, but that's a long retaining wall. So, I could not find anything in Lake Stone even remotely like that on my drive as well. So I, I would want to see an address to figure that one out to look at another one myself. Um, and I also have concerns with cutting into the into the walls like that because uh, I get to drive along Pemwash through the winter and get to see the ice build up and the rocks falling down and so on. And uh, that, that's a big concern for me as far as safety goes. And uh, Safety's got to be one of our priorities here, so um, that one's a is one that I'm not quite satisfied with personally. Um, and so I do have one question for you, Don. Um, with the uh, outfall on the previous phase when we had our, our road wash out, uh, I'm just curious how come that has not been remedied yet. Well, that, that is a really long story, and uh, I would like nothing more uh, than to invite uh, every member of council uh, down to that site so I could explain what has gone on over a period of time. But just to, uh, just for now, uh, I'll just get into it uh, a little bit, is that there was a washout there and there was a plume in the lake and um, that plume in the lake was caused from the storm exceeding the capacity of the soakaway system that was installed on Okanoga, not the center road. And the water that exceeded the capacity comes out of a, a graded manhole at the end of the uh, system and that water eroded uh, the, the road bank of uh, Okanagan Center Road, and that's what caused the plume in the lake. Uh, since that time, and immediately after that storm, which uh, I've been told by people from Environment Canada in certain areas, I have no records of it exactly in this location, but that storm uh, was, was it was spoken that it, it could have exceeded the 200 year event, and at minimum uh, was uh, exceeded the 150 year storm event. So, Every system in the valley, in the path of that storm, had erosion problems. It wasn't just that spot. Uh, after the erosion took place on, on Okanagan Center Road, we took it upon ourselves to replace the, uh, the part of the road that was eroded with blast rock. And I believe there was something like 45 truckloads of blast rock uh, placed in the roadway to support the road and to replace the, the, the part that was eroded. And we also created a riprap kind of channel from the rated manhole so that if a storm uh, happened again, that the water would come out of the manhole, follow the riprap channel and filter through the road bank that was replaced with blast rock. And since uh, that time, there have been several events that have exceeded the capacity of that system. And uh, the system operated just fine with the water coming out of the manhole uh, following the riprap stream, going through the riprap that we put in the ditch and then found its way to the lake. Uh, flash forward to today, we have been working with the municipality to, um, to, to take a look at that whole system. And we agreed with, uh, to completely design a brand new system, totally um, independent from the system that's there, but it's actually in addition to the system that's there. And there's a new system that's been designed and presented to the engineering department, which they have accepted. And it's going through the approval process right now, I believe, with the government. And I, th I believe the municipality has it in their hands right now to deal with land issues to, uh, to construct this uh, new system. Uh, the system is designed. We're prepared to build it as soon as uh, the district gives us the go ahead to build it and the ability to go onto the land. And um, it's a system that we're picking up the tap for at our expense. And, um, 
And there's a lot more history to this. And uh, if any council members would like to come down to that area with me, I will gladly explain it in more detail. But um, I guess in summary, we have a, a new system design ready to build at our expense and we're ready to move forward as soon as the district gives us the go ahead. Um, Matt, uh, if I can get our uh, Mr. Salmon to comment on that, I just would like to hear what we have on our end, please. Um, yeah, so through your worship, um, um, obviously I'll, I wasn't in this position at the time when this this issue first um, arose, but um, I have on good authority from my predecessor that uh, there was issues with the functionality of this system um, pretty much from day one. Um, so it's very hard to um, exactly say that uh, you know the system was overwhelmed um, because we knew that it wasn't functioning correctly from from the very start. Um, so this is obviously you know an issue that's been going on for a, a number of years now, and uh, and yes, we we we, we finally uh, have received a uh, a design uh, from the from the applicant that uh, we're we're moving forward. Um, I do believe that uh, Flimro. Um, have uh, have been engaged to to ensure that uh, the environmental aspects of the design are are um, are um, uh, what's the word is are uh, acceptable from their point of view. Um, so we can get the section eleven, um, and because of the because of the the uh, the design location where it has to cross private property, um, the, the district has. Um, uh, volunteered to to take those uh, land negotiations uh, on um, with the property owner um, to try and to secure that corridor that's required for for that flow route. So um, yeah, I think we can all agree that we would like this resolved uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just unfortunate that to, it's, it's taken this uh, this long to get here. Um, and like I said before, the um, you know the the, the storm system from the summit phase will be the last phase that will tie into this system. So it's imperative that this this issue is addressed and uh, is functioning correctly before before that system comes online. Thank you. So um, just to clarify with that rain event, just so you're aware, that was an average rainfall for that month overall. So just just to clarify. Um, so I'd also like to um, I know about the tree removal plan. Um, one thing that uh, is in there, it, it, it talks about removing the trees, but it doesn't talk about putting anything else up and those two large trees of concern. Um, obviously, we're in the right smack in the middle of nesting season right now uh, until August. And, uh, you know, for like I said, the last meeting, I have one tree alone in my yard with two nests in it. So it's uh, it's something there that I'd be concerned about removing any trees at this point in time. Um, and, you know, in that report, there was really no solution offered to those trees. So I'd be curious, you know, what uh, what's the plan with that? I believe that we have Teresa low on, on on the call with us. Teresa, are you able to uh, speak to that? And while we're waiting for Teresa to see if she can come on, um, so we, we spoke to Teresa about that. And any uh, any construction that goes on now, um, there, there will be a tree survey done, a bird survey done, and uh, every tree that that has nesting going on will be avoided and will be monitored strictly by our environmental consultant on site. And those trees will not be touched until after the nesting uh, period is over. Now, Teresa's online now. Teresa, can you go ahead? Yes. Um, yeah, with with regards to the trees proposed for removal, um, what we did propose to offset that were, were the bird and bat boxes. Um, we did not propose planting of new trees. The reason for that was um, the areas that are left undisturbed um, are largely, they're intact, um, they're healthy ecosystems that are functioning properly as they are. So it doesn't really make sense to densify those areas with more trees. Um, they're, they're functioning 
well as as they are right now. So um, that's where we said there wasn't a landscape plan at this time. They're really the only opportunity to replant would be on the lots themselves. But at this time, we don't have designs for that, that we could incorporate those recommendations um, because we don't have a landscape plan to work with. So the intent was to, in the meantime, uh, look at habitat restoration opportunities such as bird and bat boxes. Um, and then when a formal landscape plan is prepared uh, for the areas that are proposed for disturbance, that's when you could look at uh, native uh, restoration plantings at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, I also uh, would like uh, to ask um, about the 12% grade um, that we have, which is over our bylaw on a on a high road. Obviously, we're going to have um, we're going to have some uh, issues there in the winter. And Don, I was just curious if that is actually on the hairpin turn that it's the 12%. Um, I prefer our engineers speak to that, but I, I'm pretty sure I've got this right. Um, uh, the, the steeper grades are, are not into the hairpin. The, the grades uh, uh, gradually flatten out as you come into the hairpin and then increase again as you come out of the hairpin. I see we have James Kay on the, on the line right now. James, could you speak to that really quickly? Mute. <laughs> Can you get him? I'm sure they're trying to give James permission to speak, but uh, I, I'm almost certain though that the grades are reduced coming into the hairpin corner. Uh, James, give me a thumbs up on that. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, to the question. Absolutely. We've designed this road with the best engineering practices. We certainly do flatten out through the curve and the 12% section is, is outside of the curve to make it safe for everybody. Is the 12% on the downside or approaching? We certainly have a 12% on the on the high side of the curve. I, I believe I'm pulling up the drawings now. I believe we are approaching 10% on the the uh, downhill uh, side of the curve, but it is not 12 through the curve. So 12% approaching approaching the hairpin turn, and 10% out. Okay, thank Correct. you. Thank you. Um, so thanks for answering those questions. So. Um, I do need to echo uh, my fellow councillors' concerns that uh, we have engineering that uh, is suggesting they do not have enough information to approve stuff like the drainage and uh, others here. You know, I read that um, at least four times in that report. So I, I do have concerns with approving something that uh, some variances that um, our engineers not uh, not uh, ready to approve. So. I, I personally have have issues with that right now, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Koza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I had a long list here as usual uh, going into this, but uh, most of that stuff has been hashed out and uh, rehashed. And uh, the bottom line for me is I just think we're trying to grab too much at once. And uh, I think that uh, what we need to do is just take a step back and go at it a little slower and uh, do it that way. Uh, if we fast track this stuff, we'll get ourselves in a bind. And uh, I follow the echo what a lot of my other counselors say, and that uh, just some of these things we just have to look at and we have to come to a better answer than, than these variances. It just doesn't work. And uh, that's about all I have to say because everyone has pretty much hashed it all out quite extensively. Thank you. OK, thank you. And uh, Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and yeah, a lot of the uh, the questions I had have been asked and answered. And uh, just a couple of small things. Um, just to go back to the curbs. Is is there a reason why we want? Like I, I get that you'll do whatever we want, but is there a reason why you wanted the rollover curb? Um, yes, uh, rollover curves um, make it easier for, um, so when people build a house, when you have a barrier curve, you have to provide an access for 
uh, their garage and their driveway. And we have to determine basically before we sell a lot where that buyer is going to actually build his house and how he's going to access his lot. When you have a rollover curve, he has that uh, flexibility to, to put his driveway wherever he wants. With that being said, um, we feel barrier curbs are very important as well. And wherever there's no uh, houses fronting the street, we have barrier curbs designed into the system. And, um, and then the only change to that would be into the hairpin corner, which we agree with the municipal engineers and the traffic engineers that that section should also be barrier um, to prevent people from sliding around the corner. Um, the rest of the lots, uh, there's no way to slide, especially on the uphill lots. So we can roll over curbs serves the best purpose there. Uh, but again, if the district wanted, we would go to barrier curbs throughout the entire phase. We, we have no problem with that. Okay. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you for that. I just wanted to understand the reasons why. So, and I, I get that. Um, the. Uh, We've asked about the drainage and we, we sorted that one out. That's, you know, that's one of the things that uh, that's incredibly important. And I think that, um, you know, this this talk about the 150 year storm. Or 200 year storm. We've got this thing called climate change and that 150 year storm is now a one in 20 storm or maybe a one in 10 storm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's you know, it's great that we have another system coming. So hopefully it can deal with that because you know to, to plan for the uh, one in 150 year storm i think in this day and age it might have been okay 10 years ago well it wasn't but we just didn't know now we know we got to change what we're doing and i think that uh, obviously we have here um in regards to the retaining walls um normally this is a place where i i uh, i'm not happy about big retaining walls but in this case, I am not willing to exchange land for, for stepped up retaining walls. Uh, I'm not willing to lose green space over those. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're losing green space to the subdivision. If it happen, I get that. Trust me, I understand that. However, if we can limit the loss of green space as much as possible, I think that's incredibly important and and um, you know I, I think after looking at this as many times as I've looked at it, I don't see another way to uh, to minimize the site of site disturbance. So I, I don't love the the high retaining walls, but I don't see a better way to do it. So um, I'm not going to be a stickler on that that particular one. Um, but you know throughout the report we talk about you know. We got about, I don't know, 50 pages on bat boxes, bird boxes, and how lizards cross the road. I got to. Or maybe 150 pages. I don't know how many pages we got of it. So my question is, and, and uh, Teresa, I think, referred to this. Are these things going to get built? I mean, is, is that going to happen? Um, you know, and, and while she's answering that question, the other question I would have is, it, yeah, it's great that we've come up with a plan to look at that we're removing habitat from. It's a little bit problematic that we haven't got a landscaping plan, and I understand why, but at the same time, you know, for someone not to address the fact that plant loss is plant loss. Plants, plants provide, and trees provide a huge function. And, um, you know, so what I would hope to see is that there's an inventory of what's removed. And when we come back to landscaping plans, that that's taken into account because the restoration is going to be incredibly important to the planet, right? I mean, you know, if, if we're going to provide houses for, uh, for bats and birds and crossings for lizards, I mean, first off, I'd like to like to see that and know that that's going to happen. <laughs> but oxygen is something that the plants the lizards the bats and us need <laughs> so we're taking away the ability to produce a whole lot of it so hopefully that can be addressed through restoration when the landscaping plan comes in so 
Maybe uh, Teresa can speak to that. Teresa is available still yeah. or Dawn, yeah. whoever there she is. like are these things going to get built or is that just a if or when or what? Yeah, Good. no, the intent is that they do get built. I think at this stage with the designs, we would want to um, more detailed designs. So I we did have a meeting with Alpine um, back in the fall to discuss where these eco passages might be uh, incorporated into their um, infrastructure designs. So I think just we're at the stage of design um, we're at, um, they, you're just not maybe seeing that right now. Um, but yeah, with, with respect to all of those recommendations, the intent is that they do happen. And there's a few ways to go about doing that. That can be through um, environmental monitoring on site. Um, we could do a, a more detailed restoration plan. I know that Dawn is currently looking at um, hiring somebody to do a plant inventory and salvage. Um, it's, uh, let me just pull it up here, Seed Co Community Conservation. So that's uh, in the works right now as well, um, as well as uh, we could um, assign a security bonding amount to the work and ha have that bonded. That is another way to ensure that those things are implemented. Um, so yeah, at this stage, I think that we just we haven't gotten to the point of a landscape design quite yet. Um, but there are ways of making sure that these things do happen and follow through has occurred. So I guess the, the next question is to Dawn, because you've just suggested ways that it could happen, but ways that it could happen don't mean they're going to happen. So. I, I, I guess that's the commitment that, uh, that I'm looking for. Is this going to happen? Well, I, did, I guess the best way to answer that is I, I just want to go on record is that I've been in front of you many times over the last almost 20 years. Um, I don't believe there's ever a time where I've ever uh, said uh, I was going to do something and never did it. Um, I can commit to you now that uh, any compensation that the environmental consultant wants from us, it will get done. We are more than prepared to bond, do anything it takes to uh, to give council that comfort level. But um, I'm on record here and I'm on camera and, and I, if I say it's going to get done, it's going to get done. Well, yeah. thanks for that, Don. But, you know, and I, and I appreciate that. That's what I, exactly the commitment that I'm looking for. You know, it, all through these documents and nowhere it says could happen. This is what could happen, but it, there's no commitment there in those reports. So. Now that you said it, there's commitment there, and I'm happy with that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Good. And um, there's one more question I had going back to to Matt Salmon is ramifications of I don't think he explained it, or maybe I fell asleep, which is entirely possible <laughs> um, of burying the sewer deeper. What? That was the question I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> that was Bill's first question. What What are the ramifications of that? Is there? I mean, I, I don't understand it. I mean, obviously, it's a little harder to get to, but. Um, An area of mosquitoes over winter. <laughs> yeah, so through your worship, um, the, the, the implications of the sewer depth are essentially that the protection and the cover that that, that offers, but more importantly, the, the protection from frost damage. So deeper is better. Yeah. yeah, so and, and the reason and the reason why the engineering comments are as they are in the report is because um, the retaining walls obviously will dictate the, 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 the sewer depth variance as well. And so will the design speeds and the other two variant and the other variants um, as well. So, so they are a package of variances. So it's going to be hard to to say that OK, well, let's do this one and, and, and not have the impacts of the others. So hence why they've been brought forward to council as a, as a package. So it's not necessarily that we're against or opposed to the to the lowering of, or the, the, the raising, if you like, of the sewer. It's the fact that it cannot be considered in isolation without considering the rest of the variances also. And, and therefore, um, right now, there is not enough technical information to be able to support that package. Well, thanks for the answer. I mean, we're, you know, again, as you know, we're not engineers. So when there's a variance for sewer, to me, I just ask why. I'd, I'd like to know the reason why. And, and so, yeah, it's tied to the other things. Um, the other issues, 
you know, in, in terms of design speed of the road, I, I don't have a comment about that. I think um, it is what it is when you got a hairpin turn. And, uh, uh, you know, I've spent my whole life driving in the mountains and up mm -hmm. hundreds of hairpin turns. So um, you, it is what it is. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gamble. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, were you done or done? No. Uh, sorry, just on the um, the information that the engineering department requires, I, I, w I wonder if uh, Mr. Salmon could be more specific on what further information uh, is required. Like we have the 100% um, the design done plus the, the traffic engineer's input. Um, I, I, you know, we're more than willing to provide any possible information that the engineering department wants, but uh, the finer details uh, that could be um, resolved with maybe further information, could that not be um, handled through the design review process? Uh, so we don't have to come back to council again for these variances uh, when the engineering department has the comfort level of approving all of this and making uh, their suggestions through the design review process. Uh, I think we all agree that the variances are warranted. Uh, I, I believe the engineering department feels that way. Our team feels that way, and so do the traffic engineer. And uh, we'd be uh, happy to deal with it through the design review process if that's possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have Councilor Gamble. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so some of the questions that I have, I have not been able to resolve. Um, uh, our staff is saying that this is uh, this uh, uh, is going to be a minor collector road, according to our master plan, and yet you are saying no, it's a local road. Um, and and uh, you know we did hear um, that a local road functions much different um, from a minor collector road, which handles a lot more traffic, larger road capacity. A uh, lot larger number of vehicles on it and at higher design speeds. Um, when I look at that hairpin turn, I counted seven lots on the outside of the hairpin. Now, I live in this community, I've lived here all my life. Uh, I go up the lakes. Uh, you know, I tell you, you go up and down there in the winter, uh, that's challenging. That is a wide road. This is going to be a much narrower road. It is going to connect to the rest of the subdivision. It's going to connect to that, what you call, I think you're calling it the east side phase. Is that right? And then there's another one to the south. Um, I don't know how many houses altogether there will be in those two, but, but a significant number, and they're all kind of going to be winding their way up and down this hill um, and and so I mean four lots right at the hairpin we go around a hairpin down Okanagan Centre Road any of you who or uh, sorry uh, I call it Okanagan Centre it's Camp Road yes. we go down a real hairpin uh, if you've gone down there I'm sure you have many times and uh, I don't think there are any there's one one house well it's not really a house on that hairpin we're talking seven lots on the hairpin that, as you just said, will be entering that hairpin corner. Uh, there are four lots on the other side. So I am thinking about this from a safety perspective, and, and I know that you have thought this out, but I am thinking about it from a safety perspective, and I, I really have a hard time uh, really thinking about how safe this is going to be in the longer term. Um, and, and I say that because I know that um, uh, one of my cousins uh, had a stepson who drove down one of these roads when he was 21 with, you know, a very fancy car and of course ended up smushed and as well as his occu the occupant in the car. Um, I don't want us to set up our community for that kind of situation. And I, if you didn't have, I think, such a sharp corner there, I, I like hairpins in the right spot, okay? I don't dislike them. But here you've got a real slope 
and you're coming down a fairly steep hill, 12% we're talking, to a very <coughs> hairpin that isn't at 12%, but nevertheless. I mean, I'm trying to imagine this, but I am doing my best because I know that what we decide around here is what the community has to live with for probably, you know, 50, 100, 200, who knows how long, years. And so I think it's it's important that we together get this right. And I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with some of these things. I, I, I love that area. It's absolutely gorgeous. But I am struggling with these things because I don't think that that is in the best interest of our community, how that's developed. And, uh, you know, I, well, maybe you can give me some assurance because right now I, I can just see a nightmare happening. Are you speaking with me, Penny? I said I can see a nightmare happening with all of these, you know, these entrances onto this, you know, and, and you're saying 30 kilometers an hour, but that's not what our master plan says. So if, if I could speak to that, the, the engineering department at the municipality, our engineering team, uh, uh, with the owner is a uh, certified traffic engineer, plus two independent traffic engineers have looked at this. Um, we, we all feel that the, the speed reduction um, is, is an important issue. The alternative is to eliminate the hairpin, and in order to do that, to get from point A to point B, you're creating a road with a cons more consistent 12% uh, grade uh, and the problem with that is going down to the bottom of the hill, you're going into two 90 degree turns at the bottom of the hill. So uh, what the engineers are looking at when they make this decision is that slowing down the traffic uh, in this section is really important, not only for the hairpin, but for the traffic continue, continuing on down to the bottom where all of a sudden they're going to be into a 90 degree turn. So if you were to maintain 40 kilometers or 50 kilometer speed zone, and in the winter, people getting to the bottom of the hill, that's where all your problems are going to be. So it's been looked at, uh, Penny, from every angle. Uh, and a bunch of engineers way smarter than me have determined that, you know, uh, these variances are warranted. And uh, that's the best explanation I can give you. Mm. Okay, thank you. Well, I think you've, you've made some good points there. I, I can certainly understand slowing the speed okay. down. Uh, I don't know how that will function for the, the longer part of the road. That's the only question. I guess our engineer would be the one to respond to that. Okay. I don't know, Matthew, if you're there. Yeah, Matthew's there. <laughs> yeah, so through your worship, um, you know, I, I, I think there's an important point to make here, and that, that is that um, you know, the, the, the district dean team did, uh, did call a meeting with the, with the owner's engineers um, team last week in order to try and um, progress this and move this forward and, and come up with a with a solution and and I, and I think it's on the horizon. Um, I, I just think it needs a little bit more collaboration and you know the fundamental um, questions that we have as a as an engineering team are are what are the impacts of the variances? That's the bit that's not clear. We're not disputing the engineering or the science behind them. What we're what we're trying to understand is the impacts to safety. What are the impacts to functionality? What are the impacts to operations? What does a what does a tighter radius hairpin with a steep with a with a reduced sight line mean for snow plows, for garbage trucks, for snow clearance, for the stormwater system? Because clearly we have a, a schedule Q that talks about hillside that, that that specifies these requirements for hillside developments. That's what it's for. So oh. it's already taken it's already taken these challenges oh. into account. So when we when we are looking at varying those standards and specifications, we have to understand firstly why, what's the reasoning, what's the rationale for for varying these 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 uh, established standards, and what are the impacts for doing so? And that's the piece of the information that's missing. So as a result of the meeting that we had on Friday, there was um there was a piece of work that the engineers would do to run certain turning templates, for example. Okay, so 
can the garbage truck get around this hairpin? Does it have to go into the cycle lane in order to do so? Um, how does the snowplow get around here? Like in the winter, like they're the questions that we need to understand because uh, as we mentioned before, once this road's in, it's in and it's in for a long, long time. So we need to make sure we understand what it is, what the compromises we are being asked to make are and what those operational impacts are that we are going to inherit and have to manage in the future. No, um, I have uh, John, John uh, wanted to uh, McDonald. Make, yeah, comment on that. I thought I saw a hand there. Go ahead. Is he can he get on? You got him tech? Yeah. We'll get you there. We'll get sound eventually. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Are you receiving? Now we can. OK. Um, yeah, I think, um, and you know, as Matthew mentioned, you know, those um, those studies were completed a lot. Um, I think they were sent in on Monday um, about the turning races. Um, I think I just want to speak to um, uh, Councilor Gamble's comments. Um, I think you made the comment about local road versus uh, collector, you know, a lot of the decision, a lot of as we've gone through the, the master plan redo and and summit phase is you know, we've been trying to respond to the concerns that have been raised by council and I'll, those go into a lot of this and a lot of it comes down to, to trade offs. So um, an example is that cul-de-sac that came off of the summit in the original plan. Uh, Corey highlighted that earlier in her presentation. That's achievable and it gets us more lots, but it comes into the natural environment. And also because of that steep grade, as Don mentioned, there's retaining walls on retaining walls. There'd be a retaining wall at the bottom of those new lots, plus the retaining wall behind them to support the lots above, which support the road. And so in working through it, you you looking at you look at that and say, okay, well, can we make this all work for us with fewer retaining walls? and fewer disturbance in the natural environment. Don went through that with his team and came up with a solution that works for that. So though you see a retaining wall that's that's very big, for sure, it's a lot less than the design as it was originally proposed um, for the reason I described, and a lot less um, intervention into the natural environment. So decisions like that have been made to come into this. So when you see a, a retaining wall that's height, uh, it's an important piece of context is that's a lot less half the retaining wall that was there originally. So we're trying to we're working to respond to the concerns that you guys have been raising. Um, and then part of the, the consequence of having fewer cul-de-sacs coming off of the road, less you know, figure you know, this comes down to the master plan. There's a ridge line, the road going down it. The further you exceed the go away from the ridge line, the higher the retaining walls to catch the grade, the more uh, bifurcated the natural environment is. So we've pulled that back, have more contiguous lots in the road. So that's a, now that's a trade-off. So when you have more intersections with the road, it becomes more like a local road. And because there's just more driveways on it. And the safe thing to do is to slow down. So that's now that now we have a trade-off, right? If you have it's going to take a guy at the top of the hill two more minutes, one, two more minutes to get down to the hill, bottom of the hill. But in exchange for that, you've got more contiguous open space, fewer retaining walls. For us, that's a, um, a trade off that makes sense to us. And I think that's the trade off that we've taken away from our conversations with you that you'd like to see. So it's on the now, we can now, so we make these decisions, we present these plans to you. Now it's a question of just the technical details of how do we. Um, there's positives and there's negatives to the trade-offs. How do we mitigate the negatives? And so that's, you know, that's the, some of these things that we're talking about, the variances that are needed to help mitigate those negatives of the trade-offs that we've been making. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there for your consideration. I think it's an important, uh, you know, part of what we're looking at. But thank you for the time. Thank you for that. And uh, Councillor Reed. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, could I just ask three questions? One's just a point of clarification because I'm getting confused as to what was um, this curve. I heard from um, the McDonald team that their grades were, there was no high grades over the hairpin. Like I took away from that conversation that the hairpin was relatively fast and there was a high grade below and a high grade um, above. However, the document that we're reading on page 13 says the proposed grades over the hairpin section of the road range from one to 10%. So that seems to contradict the information that was just presented to council over the video link. So could we confirm what which is correct? I, I, sorry, uh, Councillor Reid, if I could just clarify, we, we were asked, we were talking about 12% grades coming down. And what I said was that the 12% grade was reduced coming into the hair. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, oh, I said, James, James, can you go ahead and speak? I, I, I don't think I said it was flat in the hairpin. I said the no, grade I was reduced. Self -done. So. I think it was from another member of the team. Okay. Through your worship, absolutely. The clarification is that we are not exceeding or we're not uh, using 12% through the curve. Coming from the top of the mountain down, there is a section at 12%, but as we approach the hairpin, we flatten to 10%, at which point about halfway through the hairpin, we flatten uh, to, to 1%. So we absolutely are um, reducing the grade through the hairpin to respect the safety of the traveling public. Okay, I just wouldn't use the word flatten to 10%. I would probably use reduce to 10% given you are 8% is the right wrong grade. Um, <laughs> So um, I also, I, I think Councillor Gamble's points are well made about the usage of this road um, in the sense of the debate over whether it's a collector or whether it's um, a local in opinion of the, um, the developers traffic surveys. I just looked at the master plan. There are going to be 595 houses in the Highlands, um, according to the master plan. And the only way that they can get to the Benchlands which has the sports court and all the lovely facilities. And these are multifamily residential, residential, so houses that don't have their own private gardens. So they're the ones who are going to be using them. They are going to be the only way for them to logistically get down to Benchlands and all the amenities there is through Beacon Hill Drive. So that's 500, 600 houses, let's round it up, with two, one, two cars each, so it's going to be for a high traffic road. Um, that's a lot of people on one road. And I don't I would support the, uh, the the collector notation because that's exactly what it seems to be doing, collecting people from other neighborhoods and then depositing them onto Tyndall Road. So um, I, I don't think you're going to sway me on the, on the local road and therefore um, that. Um, but uh, I think um, math. Uh, Director Salmon's points were really well made and I haven't been on council long, but this is the first report that I've come across where there has been no recommendation or no impact assessment from the engineering team on key points. And um, that's that's concerning to me. I, it's never happened before. We've had other big um, proposals come before us and there's never been that absence of information that has, innate, has not enabled them to provide an assessment um, on on the safety um, and on the function um, and how this road will impact the neighborhood, not just now, but long after you and I and everybody around this table is gone. So um, given the comments that it's coming to it's on the horizon for me, I just feel this is a this is too early to make those decisions. And if we do have that ability to have that information presented to us in a short period of time, which it sounds like it will be with everybody working together, I think for me, I would really appreciate being able to see both sides of this discussion, both the reports that you have presented as, as the applicant, but also allowing staff to present their conclusions from those reports and from those information. And I think for me personally, given it is so it's potentially imminent i think making a decision today that takes away from that process is it would be a disservice to the community on a longer term basis okay thank you and i have uh, councillor scarrow oh. well that's a tough act to follow i don't particularly agree with councillor reed 
I do particularly, uh, I want to highlight a few things that, that, that we've talked about tonight. The first thing was uh, Don touched on the fact that he's been in front of council numerous times over the past 20 years. And when he says something's going to happen, it happens. I accept that. I believe that. And I think that all of the things that we prescribe to happen in the upcoming future of this development have gone and will go as prescribed. Councillor Ireland uh, got that verbal assurance from Don and I appreciate him giving it that. We are being asked to talk about or to decide or judge on four different variances. Each of the variances has some un answered questions as Councillor Reed has put forward. Director Salmon and the rest of staff and myself know that these issues can be dealt with effectively in the design stage. In relation to McDonald Enterprises, their relationship with the District of Lake Country and uh, all of the work that they have done within our community, I believe that McDonald Enterprises deserves at least the opportunity um, to hear Council's decision on what they're proposing. In light of that, I move option A, looking for a seconder in order to provide McDonald Enterprises can't, with can't a- take, Can't take a motion until I've asked if there's anybody phoned in. This is a variant. Okay, would you do that then? Uh, when you stop talking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you stopped? <laughs> no, I'm going to make a motion after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to do. Well, but first I have to find out if anybody has phoned in from the public who wishes to comment on these variances. There has been no calls. And there's no one on the line at the no moment. Calls, no one on the line. Uh, anybody else on council wish to address the variances? Not hearing it, I'll take a message. I'll take a phone. Move option A, looking for a seconder, and uh, trust staff to deal with those questions. Final, final design, yeah. Oh. Move option A in its completeness. Looking for a seconder. Where's Councillor Koza? Is it? Nobody's. Second in the motion, anybody provide uh, one of the three? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm second, you go ahead. Sorry? Go ahead. Yeah, look at, I am, I am uh, pretty close to seconding that. Um, I am, yeah, well, possibly. Yeah. But uh, it's. I haven't spoken yet. Then I'll, I'll maybe I can convince you one way or the other. But, um, uh, the uh, there's a lot of problems here for sure. But um, I, I don't believe that there's any other choice. I, I will support the variances for the height, 100 percent, because I'm again, as I said before, I'm not willing to trade off green space for that. And they've traded off X amount of lots for that. So uh, I'm not willing to trade any green space that we just got. So um, <coughs> I am not a traffic engineer. And uh, they've said, and all the traffic engineers have said that this is the only route. Uh, it's a hairpin turn. There's lots of hairpin turns in lots of places. And uh, well, I've driven in the mountains all my life in all sorts of different countries and uh, been up <coughs> lots worse with lots more houses than, than this is going to have. Um, at the same time, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the this, this staff's position on this. So this is where I'm, uh, I'm a little bit on the fence because there, there's things that I want to approve. Uh, this is going to get, you know, it, it'd be nice to get on with it. But um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about saying, you know, I'm, I know more than the engineering department does because I don't. And um, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at the moment. So maybe I will second it for discussion because um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moved and second uh, and uh, further discussion. I go ahead, Councilor Gambo. Uh, I will not be supporting this uh, because I do not think that there is a rush um, to approve something where there are so many questions that have been raised by our own staff. Um, we do hire professional people to uh, give us their best advice and um, not to say we don't query them and question them, but it is not very frequent that they actually bring issues to us and say they have concerns and they are these are not resolved at this point in time. Um, I listen to that because to me, I feel I'm responsible uh, for what happens here and I have to live with this. Well, hopefully I live for a while longer to enjoy it, but um, but I want to make sure that we get things as as right as we can. I mean, I know we can't get everything perfect, but I do not believe that we are under any onus to meet some deadline. We need to get it right. And I'm not sure that it is appropriate to have seven lots entering, mm. uh, you know, a very sharp corner. I mean, there are changes that could be made to make this safer than it is. And I'm not the professional here. I can't say what those changes need to be, but I am concerned that if we approve this tonight, that we are going to be living with problems that will last for maybe centuries and certainly could cost lives. And I'm not prepared to support something like that. So at this point, I think that uh, what I would like to do is defer that. <laughs> I don't know if you can defer something like that. Yeah, it's A, B, C or D. Uh, well, I, I would like to defer this for more information. Oh, maybe he maybe went to the other side. No other uh, want to speak. Arthur um, McKenzie next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thanks for those comments, Penny. Um, I, I, I do agree with that, right? I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, definitely not an engineer, but I grew up with one as a dad, and I know if he was concerned about stuff, I better be concerned too, because he's a pretty smart guy. So um, we're not. Um, uh, you know, if, they, if they're concerned, I, I'm concerned on this one. And, uh, um, you know, definitely these are not in agreement. Um, and I'm not willing to trade off a shorter road for the safety of our community because all it takes is one death and that's on us. So I don't think um, it's not that I'm totally against this. It's just that I'm not uh, prepared to to uh, stick my neck out when we don't have the assurance of our own staff and our engineers that we put a lot of trust in. So uh, it's not that uh, I won't support it at some point, but I'm just not going to support it at this point. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would echo Councillor McKenzie's and Councillor Gamble's comments. Um, I would also note that we are varying a hillside uh, road, road specification. This is one that's already been tailored using best practice to deal with hillsides. So it's not we're not varying a road, normal road specification to fit a hillside. We're varying a hillside specification that's already been created after considerable review by staff um, and council just recently. Um, so that's why I think we need to think. I can't make that decision without the input of the engineering team. And I appreciate the comments that have been made about the trust, you know, that's been placed in the developers on a, on a verbal level. Um, and I think that's great that that relationship is there and long may it continue. Just going to say, sorry, no bat boxes to date. And we've done five phases of development, including in a wetland area. And there hasn't been a single bat box placed there, all bird box or herpetological tunnels. So 
at the moment, if I'm looking at that, I'm not seeing that deliverable come come true in the past phases. Um, so I think this is also an opportunity for the developer, if we give them time to come back with the work of e help of Ecoscape, scape with some more details on the on the landscaping side. Those questions as in the DP were pretty much glossed over with the we don't do de landscaping at development stage and. I think we we I can't forget that we are losing land here to build this. And in my suggestion about the retaining wall, I wasn't proposing that the retaining wall stretches out into that 54%. My suggestion stays within the developed disturbed area, but we lose some lots in order to make that road safer and with less impact on the environment. And yes, that's a decision that the developer needs to make from a financial point of view, but it's been considered in previous phases. So that was where my comment on that front was coming from, just to be clear that I wasn't proposing that it goes into the 54% of uh, undisturbed land. Okay. So I won't support okay. this proposal at stage, yes. sorry. Maybe uh, Councillor Closet has a comment. Councillor Farrell. I'd just kind of like to speak to that. I think at the beginning of Councillor McKenzie's comments earlier tonight, he suggested that this is one of the best reports, or perhaps it was Councillor Reed, that it was very readable, and the part that they enjoyed the most was that uh, staff never chose a side. Now I'm hearing that we have to wait until staff makes a recommendation. And it, and it seems to me that any recommendation, one way or the other, that staff makes impairs our independent decision making. I still believe strongly that any of the outstanding issues, including landscape, should be and can be dealt with at the development permit stage, at the design stage, excuse me. I believe, as I've said before, that this is part of our future in the District of Lake Country. In the bigger picture, a few meetings ago, a couple of us have referred to um, employment, economic uh, benefit of keeping people working, understanding the scope of the McDonald thing uh, altogether with all of its 13 phases. I think that holding this back based on details that we can work out at the next stage, the design stage, is the wrong thing to do. And I still support option A and look forward to Mayor Baker's comments. Okay, I want to hear from Councillor Koza first. He hasn't spoken. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, I'm still firm in my belief. I when I came into it, I felt that uh, option C was uh, the thing and my my option hasn't my idea hasn't swayed. Um, I just there's too many things that are just outlying too many unanswered questions and, and that's where I sit. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Councillor Ireland, did you want to be this up to death? No, I mean, you know, there, there's good points. I'm I'm really in between here. Um, I would like to. I would like to have the staff recommendation, and I, I, I do respect what Councillor Scarrow said there because. Um, you know, we've specifically asked for staff recommendations not to show up as much because there's been recommendations there that uh, right. that aren't right or we don't certainly don't agree with but that being said it's nice to see it would be nice to see the engineer saying <clears throat> that this is okay and then i uh, i'm a bit uncomfortable with that part okay. um you know there are but again the engineer is not going to comment on the wall and i am okay with the wall I'm OK with um, uh, burying the sewer because that's a function of the wall. Uh, I'm OK with the curbs. Um, you know, the, the cross section and, and the road. I want to hear some more about, but. Um, okay. yeah. Well, the, then, I think that yeah. uh, to be, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a tough one yeah. in between because I'd like to see that. I don't want to see the staff's recommendation on it. Um, Hey, this is going to happen, and uh, we need it to be the best it can be. And um, I, everybody's agreed that there's this is the best routing for the road. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly hope that uh, there's if that this gets delayed, that there's some uh, 
direction. that we don't get it back exactly the same from our staff All because right. they haven't decided. So I'll have to say my piece. And, and again, I, <clears throat> I would support uh, option A, but I, I kind of agree with Jeremy. Option C is a is a possibility, although we haven't really articulated additional information. Uh, we have said we don't like what the applicant is saying, but we haven't said what it is that we don't like. So that's option C was that uh, it uh, be for deferred pending receipt of additional information as uh, identified by council. Well, we said we don't like these things, but uh, we're looking at them and and actually they are uh, preferable to a whole lot of other slash and burn that uh, has occurred in a, in a lot of developments and because it is uh, respectful of the environment so that uh, and I, and I, my understanding is that in, in uh, sort of final design, there's a review that you go through everything and, and, and staff and the applicants agree on, on what can be done. So I, I certainly support advancing it to that stage where it can get a final review and it has to come back to staff anyway, so. <clears throat> But uh, that's that's my position. So call the question. Uh, call the question. Then those in favor of option A. One, two, which is approve, get going, get final review. Not going to have those opposed. Uh, motion fails for option A. Anybody moving another? I'll move option C. I'll second. In what direction does it sound? What do I think we uh, I think we talked pretty extensively to what uh, where the issues are. Um, obviously, we need more information from our own staff as engineering. Uh, when we get that back and they can say yes, this works, yeah. that they can confirm and it's not um, a recommendation it's an assessment it's our engineering assessment to, to that this works that's what we need to be in order to to um, approve this right why why would you um, why would you approve something when your engineer doesn't say that it's it's good to go like that to me um, we're not engineers so we have to rely on the experts and if the experts can't tell us that it's safe why would we approve it at this point it's they're saying they just need a little more information and they when they're comfortable with that then then i'm sure that the rest of us will be comfortable as well okay moved second councillor mckenzie councillor koza uh, no can't speak there's motion on the floor uh that was option c which is uh, deferred back to staff councillor gamble so i'm just wondering if uh we could uh include as a sponsor's rewording uh, uh further information regarding the uh road being a uh minor collector and not uh, that was not clear i mean even all the discussion it seemed to me there was a difference of agreement and I think that needs to be resolved. Okay. Um, also, I'd like to see uh, the resolution, a resolution to the drainage issues that have not been concluded, the ongoing drainage, which this okay. is part of because it's part of that whole hillside. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and regarding uh, the um, the use of a rollover instead of a barrier. I know we've had some comments on that, but I'd like to see that written clearly so that we know what the result is. And uh, increasing the... The what? Uh, the other thing, I, I guess, for me is uh, the 
uh, height. I mean, these are all the, the things. It's a package deal. The height of the retaining walls as it connects to uh, the depth of the sanitary sewer systems and the uh, resulting impacts of that. Okay. So I think that that's the thing that, it, you know, what will be the additional cost, if, if any, to the district? Um, what are the implications? Because uh, that, that's not safety, but it is cost maybe to us for maintenance and so on over the long term. All right. Um, Councillor Reid. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just through the chair, I wonder whether we could ask whether Director Salmon could craft the wording because we're asking for his engineering team's a safety assessment and function assessment that we're not asking for recommendations. I think we need to be very clear. We are merely asking for the same level of assessment that the applicant has been able to provide from their technical team. And in the document, um, the report, it lists um, 10 items that are required in order to make that assessment. I'm just not sure how far down the list um, the engineering team need to go in order to come back to council with their assessment of the, 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 the plan. So it asks for design drawings showing all pertinent information as required by the SDS. Design cal detailed design calculations to support of the street lighting so layout. All the extra information. Yes. So I yeah. wonder whether is that that, is that 10 items too long um, looking to Director Salmon to include as a requirement or is it what he needs in order to complete? That's what we're deferring to. So Yeah, so I'm just wondering it. whether we'd be used that as a text, then we might get a more detailed, yeah. might give the engine, the team exactly what they need on both sides. And that's it. And, if, if, and what C is doing that uh, is deferring it, until we get that information, what option A was doing was get on with it and get us that information in the final review. But C will keep it moving anyway. So, Councillor McKenzie. So, uh, just oh, sorry, just to um, to talk about C here, um, is this possible? Like, uh, I would be curious what if we approve the DP part of it, but um, defer the variance part of it, if that would be a better solution in a case like this. So I'd be Talk to curious CAO if our CAO, what comments she would have. So we have had the DP in front of council previously and council had requested to see the DP in, in conjunction with the, the variances. So Council absolutely probably could, and I'll have to, Corey, our manager of planning might be able to comment more on this, but I do believe council could approve the DP at this point and not, and then send the variances back for more information as requested there and see. But I will defer to Corey and let her comment on that. Okay, can, can she maybe comment on what that allows them to do? Just we just want to make sure we're not signing off on tree removal or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Through there, through you. Yeah. Good. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, you can uh, approve any combination of things. I think that's why I gave you option E. Um, the development permit would uh, allow uh, clearing and grubbing to occur. Uh, tree removal could begin. Um, the variances speak specifically to construction of retaining walls and um, construction of roadworks under the subdivision development servicing bylaw. They are separate from the development permit. The development permit guidelines have been satisfied, so there's not a lot um, that we have. Um, that we can say, unless you can point to a guideline that says it's not been satisfied. I think we have the undertaking from the applicant. Um, I don't think we can expect any more information on that application 
Absolutely, I've made some notes and I'm sure Director Salmon has also made some notes regarding um, information that you're looking for relative to the variances. Mm. Um, so it it would be appropriate, I guess, at the, at the end of the day, it would be appropriate to approve the development permit and revisit the development variance as a deferred item. I think the important thing to note here is that um, and Raina will be able to clarify. I, I don't know if deferral means we have to re-advertise, um, re-notify for the variances being considered, that kind of thing. So there might be a, um, a legal aspect there, but um, absolutely, I, I think you could do a combination. So you're going actually for or for option E, That's which is a combination of A and C. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can we hear from Raina just in regards to? Thank you, through the mayor. Um, so the first point listing the items um, included in the report regarding the engineering ins assessment. Uh, I don't I wouldn't recommend that that's necessary to list all 10 of the items. I will just uh, come up with wording that is specific to that item that addresses the engineering assessment if that's council's wish to have that specifically in the list of ad, um, additional information uh, it, yes and if council wants to do a combination thereof approving the dp and deferring the variance to the next available council meeting there would be no further requirements for advertising seeing as we've done it for this meeting we're just simply pushing it to the next available meeting so we wouldn't have to, uh, we're not canceling yeah. it and requiring another application. Sounds good. Okay. So um, I'll let C stand. You let C stand, you don't like E. Uh, well, we have to deal with C anyway. So uh, those in favor of option C. Aye. Councillor. Uh, Koza, I, Koza. I, so that's uh, four in favor. Uh, those against, I'm not against or for, so I'll vote for against. No, whatever. <laughs> four, three. Don't matter, no, matter yeah, so motion carries, so it's option C. Uh, silence gives consent, so that means that. <laughs> I voted in favor, but uh, so there's no combination that's uh, deferred to uh, pending receipt of additional information as identified by council and uh, Councilor Reed has a list uh, of items and others have uh, you have those uh, corporate and admin and we'll get to them okay so we move on to the next item where we deal with uh, development permit for crystal waters excellent good evening mayor and council oh. everyone see my screen <laughs> yeah You've been. Did you have an alarm clock? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes, we we hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, great. So this application um, is DP twenty twenty zero zero one C, and it is returning to council. It's for one eight two six three Crystal Waters Road, uh, which is in the rural residential future land use designation of the OCP and the RR3 zone. And this development permit is for a house and two accessory buildings within the hillside natural environment and greenhouse gas reduction and resource conservation development permit areas. And I wanted to um, let council know that the um, owner and the applicant uh, are available this evening should council have any questions for them. 
Okay, thank you. And as um, council will recall, this um, property is located adjacent to Kalamalka Lake in the northern part of Lake Country. Um, it is a vacant piece of property and it is steeply sloped. Um, and it is accessed from a private um, easement um, on the property to the north at 18281 Crystal Waters Road. So last considered this application on May 4th, it also included a development variance permit um, application for over height retaining walls that were located on the subject property and the neighboring property at 18281 Crystal Waters Road. Um, and this is the previous site plan and in red you can see the location of the previously requested over height retaining walls. At the May 4th Council meeting, Council referred um, the application back to staff to work with um, the applicant to revise the site plan to reduce the height of the proposed retaining walls. Council also uh, mentioned that um, they would like the applicant to review the retaining wall materials, consider screening of the walls, and also um, to consider the possible retention of more trees. Um, and as a result, the applicant and owners um, worked together and submitted a revised site plan that now eliminates um, the need for retaining wall variances altogether. And this is the new site plan. Um, so as you can see, um, the retaining walls um, located on the property to the north are now they're stepped um, and they allow for a gravel parking area for the neighbor, the neighbors. Um, and the retaining walls on the property, um, the subject property, are also terraced. Um, and as you'll see, they are there's a significant amount of landscaping. I also wanted to note that the retaining walls at the top of the property are um, proposed to be um, constructed with keystone, which is a more decorative lock block material than previously proposed. Um, the applicants also submitted an arborist report. Um, and that report um, noted that there were some um, dead and hazardous trees on the property and also along the top of the property, um, and I'm quoting from the report, three ponderosa pines have been identified as high risk as a result of the upper canopy, canopy weight distribution and its direction of failure impacting the new construction. Um, so no additional trees have been proposed to be retained. The applicants also submitted this 3D rendering just to give council an idea of what the retaining walls would look like on the neighbor's property, um, but they do comply with um, the zoning bylaw regulations and are stepped to reduce their visual impact. And then um, finally, just a, a reminder of what the house and the accessory um, building look like and these um, um, elevations didn't change um, since um, council last saw them. And so uh, to end, it is staff's opinion that the proposed development permit substantially meets the applicable development permit area guidelines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor McKenzie. I'll uh, move option A. Option A. Councillor Reed. I'll second that. Second. Any discussion? I have, I have something to say. Uh, Councillor Council Right. Yes, no, it's just a, it's a positive thing uh, for a change. Um, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to say that I did like the uh, and I, I didn't realize it was the applicants that had put forward that uh, rendition, but I really like that rendition. Uh, if that could be included in more uh, development permits, that would help us to see it. And as well, if you could take it a step further, I don't know if I'm asking the world here, but if you could put that right into a Google Maps rendition, that would be just superbly awesome. But I got to say that drawing was awesome and I didn't realize it was the applicant that had actually put it in, but it really laid out what was happening there really nicely. So I just have nothing but positive and uh, yeah, I second it as well. Or no, I don't know if someone else seconded it, but I, I have my full approval. We'll, uh, we'll give our planner credit for it anyway. She, she could use it and use it. Too kind. <laughs> uh, those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next one. Zoning uh, by law text amendment. Oh. Uh, nope. It's on it's, which one did I miss? Finch, Finch Road. Okay, so this is, I'm up again, Mr. Mayor. Okay. You're, you got that, uh, Finch Road? Yes. 
Yes, so this is uh, DP 2017-039-A1-A2C, which means it's the second amendment to the development permit. And this is for 5550 Finch Road. Uh, it's within the Rural Residential uh, Future Land Use designation of VOCP, um, and it's actually within a land use contract, uh, LUC 196. However, the land use contract um, refers to the underlying zoning for anything that's not specifically um, mentioned in the land use contract. So the underlying zoning is RR3. This development permit amendment is for a one-story house, detached carport, and septic field within the hillside, natural environment, wildland fire, and greenhouse gas reduction and resource conservation development permit areas. All right. uh, this property is located within the Okanagan Centre um, area. It's a long skinny lot that slopes downwards towards Okanagan Lake and it is currently vacant. Right. Two um, site photos. Um, these are taken from the top of the property um, just to give um, Council a sense of um, the location of the building site. So the one on the left is looking south um, and it does show um, the how steep it is right adjacent to Finch Road and it flattens out and then on the right hand side you can see that it then again um, begins to slope down up towards the lake. For some quick background again this is the second amendment to the development permit. The DP was first approved by council on February 20th 2018 and at that time the proposal was for a one-story house with a detached garage. Um, after the DP was approved, the owners decided to um, reconsider their design um, and made an amendment application for a two and a half story house with an attached garage, which was approved on December 3rd, 2019. And just wanted to note there was an error in the staff report. I said uh, December 3rd, 2020, so my apologies for that error. And then um, since then, the owners have decided to rethink their design again, pare it down. So the yeah. application is now for a one story house with a detached carport. All right. <laughs> this is the site plan. Um, so the house and carport are located at the top of the property. Uh, an environmental assessment was submitted with this application and the qualified environmental professional recommended that the areas that will be disturbed during construction be replanted with um, native grasses. And then these are the renderings of the house. So as you can see, um, they're on two different levels, but the roofs of both the carport and the house um, are below the road level. So um, it will um, have a, a lower visual impact on the, the hillside character of the neighborhood. Um, and additionally, the buildings will be constructed with fire resistant materials per the wildland fire development permit area guidelines. Um, and to conclude, it is staff's opinion that the proposed development substantially meets the applicable development permit area guidelines. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Councillor Arlen, Councillor Scarrell. Hold on, I uh, have something to if you want to speak to it. Yeah. So, no, thank you for that. Um, this is actually the fourth time this has been around. There's one other, there's one other application that uh, was turned down quite a bit earlier. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I've been to this property uh, quite a number of times. <coughs> and uh, you know, the, the way that this house is set back away from the other houses, it's quite interesting on a lakefront property because it's quite a ways to the lake. Um, but the concerns are that it's almost an impossible access to the lake and that there is meant to be some sort of uh, First Nations pictographs someplace down on the waterfront there on this property. Uh, that's never been confirmed 100% and I actually canoed down there one time. I didn't go on the property, but I did have a look. I could see it, but um, that's according to the neighbors. So what I'm wondering is if, I mean, the first concern I have is this house is set so far back, it's going to have almost zero view unless they cut down every tree in front of them. And it doesn't look like that's their intention but it could be. I, I'm wondering if there's any way that we can protect the, there's a, in the plan right in the very front, there's an ESA one. And I don't know if, if uh, which is covers most of that cliff down to the lake. And uh, I'm wondering if there's any way that we can protect that. I don't know if we can cut, you know, in the past, we've done covenants, and some of those haven't been quite legal. Yeah, apparently, no, I don't go there. So, 
<laughs> I'm looking exactly. for staff's guidance in here and how we can, uh, if there's a possibility of a way to protect that piece of that front of that property. Our manager of planning, Corey Gain, can speak to that. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for, you are protecting um, that slope by approving this development permit with uh, the limits of disturbance shown on the plan. It de facto protects the hillside. So there's no need to do it by another means. Um, they will have to operate within the confines of our our bylaws and our guidelines. Yeah, my, my concern would be that, of course, they don't even need to go near it in the construction. I mean, even their septic field is quite a ways away. Yeah, having walked this property a number of times over the last five years that it's been coming before us, <laughs> it's quite a ways away from the ESA one that is the, it's not the slope that the house is being built on, it's the cliff rock face that goes into the lake itself. And uh, if you were to see the neighbors to the north, um, they've done extensive work to create themselves a road down to the lake, which uh, is not all that great. So if that if it's protected in this, um, you know, the question I would ask is that it's all great that, you know, nothing happens during the construction of the house. But uh, what happens in five years when they decide they don't like all those trees and they want to build a staircase down to the beach or or blast and create, you know, there's a big, huge rock. So the property comes along like this and then there's a rock formation then it drops down and then the rocks come up and go down to the lake like down. they do in cars landing put in a people mover well in cars landing they just blow it up and <laughs> do whatever they want <laughs> so but does um, this protect it for future years yeah um we'll talk here from the planet yeah thank you your worship um so so yes um what uh, the, the manager of planning said is is correct. Um, so this um, proposal um, is what they're allowed to do. If they wanted to come back and, and do any of that tree removal that you're mentioning, um, that would actually require an amendment to the development permit. Uh, it would be a natural environment development permit, um, potentially hillside as well, which would then require um, environmental reports and, and um, that whole process. So um, the site plan um, does um, have a it shows the areas that they're going to be replanting. It's also labeled undisturbed landscape to remain. Um, so this development permit um, would only approve disturbance in the areas shown. Anything else would be contrary to the um, development permit. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Those in favor? Oh, motion carries. Thank you. And uh, that was Finch Road. Now we're around to the text zoning by amend text amendment. Zoning bylaw. Who's doing Corey. that? Uh, Corey again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me just. There we are. You should be able to see that now, I assume. All right. So. Uh, this is, of course, the beginning of our consideration of zoning, zoning bylaw text amendments. Um, we did go through them last week, so I'm going to try to keep it very um, brief. Um, I might not do quite as much explanation. Um, however, for those that may not have been watching uh, last week, I think some context would be helpful. So the essential questions are, do the proposed changes to the text of the zoning bylaw meet the community's current needs and reflect applicable updated uh, provincial regulations? And would the proposed changes improve user understanding and achieve community um, and council objectives, right? So the, the zoning bylaw guides land use by regulating the permitted use and density of land, siting, size, and dimension of structures. The authority may be exercised by incorporating maps, tables, or other graphic material into the bylaw. Generally, zoning bylaw establish different provisions for different areas, uses, and circumstances. A text amendment application can add, delete, or refine information in specific sections of the zoning bylaw. This, of course, is one of those text amendments. So this particular bylaw is, oh boy, 
there we go, is coming forward to you with the understanding, and we discussed this uh, last week, that step one is starting the conversation, agreeing on some basic principles, opening the conversation with a set of definitions and regulations that will reflect those principles, and then we can refine those definitions and regulations based on discussion um, once we have received comment from various interested parties, the public, agencies, et cetera. And then prior to adoption of those text amendments, we will review the individual zones to understand the intent and be sure that we amend the principal and secondary uses in the zones if necessary to reflect those intentions. So we're laying the foundation for that next discussion. So the principles are that we're controlling land use rather than building form, I suggest at this point. Height, setbacks, lot coverage, et cetera, can be used to, to define the building envelope. We accept that density of use is more important than what the building is called and restrictions on the building form might limit the possibilities if we define them a building form in a way that limits the combinations available. So what we want to do is make sure that as new building forms are, uh, I guess, accepted under the BC Building Code, that we're able to address them through the land use. So our principles include that any overlap between the definitions creates confusion. Regulations should be separate from the definitions and both communities and users evolve over time. So the bylaw language should also evolve. Definitions should be clear, easy to understand and use current language. Regulations should also be clear easy to locate and understand, and succinctly outline the terms and conditions for those individual uses. So what I had provided was some comparison tables summarizing zoning bylaw 561 definitions and regulations as they exist in the first, uh, I guess it's actually the second and third column, as I do have uh, a first column there talking about how many units it, it's referring to. And in the third, you know, fourth and fifth column <laughs> um, are the proposed definitions and proposed specific use regulations as relate to those. This is just an example. It's uh, fully in the report. Also attached were, of course, the amending bylaws themselves. So it's the same information presented in another way, reflecting exactly what it will look like when it's added to the text of the bylaw. So the definitions that we decided and regulations that we decided we would um, tackle first were the residential and community care definitions. So, for example, we want to delete single detached housing and single dwelling housing and replace it with single detached dwelling. And similarly, we want to delete duplex housing and replace it with dwelling duplex means a residential building containing two dwelling units, neither of which contains a secondary suite. And then we also, that covers everything, so we no longer need two dwelling housing um, in the same way um, we can talk about it as, as a building. But this is what I've added this week. I think um, what I did was I went and collected an example of some uh, dwellings. Some of them are in this in this collage. Some of them are single detached dwellings. Some of them are duplex dwellings. Some of them are multi-unit residential dwellings. The difference is, of course, how many are attached to each other, but it's the scale and how they are arranged. As uh, For example, the duplex can be either side by side, front to back, up and down. We don't really need to, to call those separate building configurations something other than the fact that it's two dwellings in a single building. And we do need to make a little bit of clarification 
that it's not a secondary suite because we talk about suites differently under the BC Building Code. Mm -hmm. So multiple dwelling housing would be a dwelling uh, unit contained within multi-unit residential building, and the building is a building that contains three or more dwelling units, regardless of the configuration. So we are able to simplify and do away with a whole bunch of definitions like multiple housing, three dwelling housing, threeplex, all meaning basically the same thing, said in different ways, which creates confusion. So at this point, I offer you option A, uh, which would give first reading to the bylaws, um, and then we would refer out for agency and public comment prior to returning for further consideration and additional readings. Um, that would give us the opportunity to introduce any comments or changes or ideas that council, the public, or any of our referral agencies have into the bylaws before they're considered for second reading. Option B um, is that the bylaws be deferred pending receipt of additional information that you may want to identify more specifically now that we're focusing on residential and care facility uses. Option C is that you uh, give first and second reading and forward it to public hearing and at which time we would go through the legislated formal process um, through the public hearing to receive um, input from, from property owners um, and interested parties. Option D is that they not be read and the file be closed. That concludes my presentation this evening and I will answer any questions that you might have. Any questions, Councillor Scarrow? Yeah, thank you very much, Corey. Appreciate that. Uh, the question I have is um, we all know that the zoning uh, bylaw rewrite is going to have an awful lot of different components to it. These are the two that are kind of the low, low hanging fruit that we're dealing with. Eh? Uh, if we were to choose option C, which is two readings and to public hearing, tell me what that looks like. Do, because of the other portions of the zoning bylaw that probably are going to be coming forward in the future, maybe not the near future. Do we collect these issues and have one public hearing on all of the them or do we have separate public hearings for each of the issues as they filter through? So very interesting question. Um, there are a bunch of different ways that we could tackle it, and certainly I haven't had a, an, an opportunity since we spoke last week to map out a plan. Um, but Director McEwen and I intend to sit down and look at uh, our schedule and map out um, a plan for how we tackle these and bring that to you to make some suggestions. At this moment, I would suggest that if you want it, if you're comfortable with the um, definitions, there's nothing really ear shattering in this uh, pair of um, bylaw amendments. And remember, it's never written in stone. We can always change it again when we need to as we evolve. However, if we if we got the process going, we could um, engage the public and start that more public conversation in a very formal way. Um, alternatively, we could um, group them together. What I'm kind of imagining at this point, and I see Director McEwen is here so he can add his um, perspective. We just simply haven't had time to discuss it is Maybe we have public hearings on small groups of the bylaw. We hold them at third reading to adopt them as a comprehensive package. Because remember, we talked about coordinating all of the changes once we've had a robust conversation about it. So different ways that we can do it. We're pretty open to your ideas. We are going to have to dedicate quite a lot of effort um, of staff time and council time. Um, to getting ourselves current again and making the zoning bylaw what we need it to be to do what we need it to do. Um, so we recognize that we're open to thoughts. Uh, happy to hear about them. 
Well, anyway, I, I'm, I, I would lean towards option C, but I don't think I'll make that motion yet in light of hearing from other councillors and my motions haven't been really doing that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, here, I'll hear from uh, Director uh, McEwen. Thank you very much, uh, your, your Worship, members of Council. I just had to prove that I was actually here this evening, uh, albeit from the, uh, the, the home office and I can't take credit for the art behind me. Um, with, with that being said, I want to add a bit of context regarding the, the public hearings and, and, and really the scope and scale of the zoning bylaw amendment uh, process. Um, what Corey has, uh, has prepared um, this evening, and as Council will recall, and even the previous uh, meeting where this was kind of chunked out in terms of, you know, what do we want to tackle in each uh, specific meeting? Um, this only scrapes the surface. This, in fact, really represents the uh, the tip of the iceberg in what we are considering an incremental modernization process for the zoning bylaw. Um, and it's only to get it to a point where we have a more workable current bylaw. And then from there, our, our hope is to take it and tweak it to be truly innovative and progressive. And hopefully we can do some progressive things along the way. Um, but the reason why I provide this context is the zoning bylaw review and update is likely to be a multi-year process and is likely to include um, tens of public hearings. Um, so when we can consolidate them, uh, it's, it's potentially financially prudent. It's potentially uh, prudent in terms of getting people to the table with respect to public engagement in a meaningful manner. Um, in, in, in one single meeting. Now, some items may need to be chunked out and be dealt with specifically in their own public hearing. They may be much more contentious and that's totally um, understandable and acceptable and, and part of good decision-making processes. Uh, but that being said, this will be kind of one of those things that we'll have to, to wiggle into and get comfortable with as we make our zoning bylaws a bit more malleable in the future than they have been historically. And uh, so I, I, I can definitely empathize with your uh, your questions around, do you wish to segment this and, and save it up for a, a lot of public hearings? When in fact, every bylaw uh, amendment is to, um, to an extent uh, like a, a development application and in fact requires its own public hearing. Um, so they, they kind of open and chunk off um, with each amend, amending bylaw. Uh, so that is also one consideration. Now you can hold up many in one night, so it functionally seems the same, but it's something to be uh, mindful of as well. So that's all I have for you this evening, and uh, you know I'll, I'll get back to sitting in my winter coat under my air conditioner here. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, Corey, thanks for the presentation. Um, this uh, leads on from Councillor Scarrow's point of uh, points that he raised in in the sense that we're dropping a stone into a pond here, and it kind of ripples everywhere. So, just for my clarity, when I look at the things that we're changing today and the um, streamlining of the definitions, how does that? Can you maybe explain also for for the public listening? Um, if anybody's still with us at 10 o'clock at night, um, <laughs> how does that affect something like the RM zone? So you have something like RM2, which is low density row housing, which uses the very definitions to kind of say, OK, you can build multiple houses, but they're going to be there's no apartments. And then you have something like low RM4, low density, multiple housing that allows row housing, but also al allows apartments. Now, in these definitions we're proposing, we lose the granularity between a row house and an apartment, and it's just called multi-residential. So how does that ripple through into something like this, where there where are two zones with two very different concepts in terms of what's going to be built, but what we've now removed the granularity of definition? I can explain that for sure. Fantastic. So Thank you. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's in defining that building envelope, right? Uh, so how much of the lot can you cover? How high can the building be? How many meters is it? Um, 
what configuration do the do, uh, upper stories need to be stepped back? So I would see the, the distinction likely between um, the two zones that you've talked about is one's probably, a, a, I don't even know, a, maybe a nine meter height maximum where it would be row housing only. And if you wanted to allow apartment buildings, then it'd be much higher height. Um, if we think about the apartment that we recently did the development permit application for that was, I believe, a five story building. I don't necessarily like using the term story because it doesn't mean anything, but that's why I like to think about defining, OK, what's the envelope? What what area can you build within? What's that going to look like? In fact, I've seen, um, believe it or not, Lego used at conferences to demonstrate this, talking about the mass of the building and by defining that building envelope, you can get an idea of what different configurations can occur within that envelope. So the difference between the zones becomes the density, the number of units per unit of area and this building envelope that you've defined. That's the distinguishing um, feature. So it may well be as we go forward, and this is why it's important when we think about it, is we may be changing those zones to articulate what outcome we're hoping to achieve in, in the zone and how best to do that with some simple definitions and clear regulations. I really appreciate that. And I, I like I just picked up on you said about the uh, the number of dwellings per lot, and I think that would add a lot of clarity because we've run into problems before where the density percentage gets used one way for maybe eight large buildings and then it gets represented at a later stage as 24 small buildings and that's very different, but the zoning accommodates has already been approved. So anything we can do to kind of uh, look at it from a, a volume sat standpoint in terms of the number of dwellings per lot or per unit of measure. I think that would add clarity to the particularly to the rezoning process as well on both sides. Absolutely, absolutely. There's lots of opportunity for us to refine uh, the, our densities. Um, I noticed when I started working on this project that our official community plan isn't very specific with respect to densities um, as they relate to the various different land use designations. And that's something that probably is going to be one of those conversations that we're going to need to look at in a little more detail before we get to the end of the project. But remember, we're this is step one. Yeah. OK, thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Corey, for that presentation. Uh, I'm uh, comfortable with this, uh, these changes. I think this is well done. So um, I'm willing to uh, move uh, option C. <laughs> <laughs> uh, forward to public hearing. How much time between first and second reading uh, can you can you have before you actually have a public hearing on it? Can you hold them for some time and then get a bunch more and then have one public hearing? Yes, you can. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Option C then. Those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. I just really quickly talked to it because option A was referring it to be read a first time. We referred out to agency and yeah. public comment. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, was there a need in this particular instance to refer to an agency in terms of what we're proposing to change? Was there a value in doing yeah. that? They'll get at us. Uh, we it's a first and second reading. It'll be announced that it will become upcoming in a public hearing yeah. sometime in the future. So there'll be lots of time. OK, yeah. OK. Fantastic, thank you. So that motion carried anyway. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, Lake Pine Local Service Area, they've been waiting for a number of years. Councillor Scaro moving, Councillor McKenzie, so I'll second. That uh, we, yeah, first, second, and uh, option A. 
Yeah. You second it? Yeah. I seconded option A. Option A. The car want to present because he's been standing. <laughs> he's been waiting. Whatever. Option A gets them water. <laughs> Kyle, take the rest of the night off. <laughs> you waited for what, Kyle? I I'm having trouble seeing what's happening. Did that? Did option A just get voted through, or do you? Do you uh, yeah. Pick? Those in favor, option A is on the floor. Motion carried, unanimous. Thank All you, Mayor Council. Nice you presentation, have? Kyle. You get a xylem pen now. <laughs> you get, you get a xylem. You get a xylem pen, a, a Grinfoss hat, or you get a, a whole Myers pump. Yeah, and because um, that's about what just, they're worth. If Kyle's still listening, um, make sure he gets that line going down the right, uh, right easement or stat right away. You had it right in the first place, Kyle. Yep. Yeah, we'll make sure of that. Thanks. Thanks, Good. Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, crossing agreement. That's uh, very good. Kind of Darling Road. That's, uh, Good evening. That's, um, Hi, my name's Evan Smith. I'm an Eng Tech about to present for Darlene Road. Okay. Is, um, Councillor Kozub available? You still listening? Councillor Kozub? That's his right. Can you see me now? Can everyone yeah. see my presentation? Barely. Yes, we can. Oh, very nice. So we're here to discuss an encroachment on the district road dedication adjacent to 11290 Darlene Road. Uh, current owner is looking to upgrade the existing wooden retaining wall to a concrete cinder block wall. The district is seeking council's direction prior to advancing owners' works in the road uh, in the district road dedication. Uh, subject property is located on the west side of Darlene. The house was built in 1990 and has an existing access permit which was issued by the Ministry of Highways in the same year. After investigation, staff believes the current driveway line is likely to be the original. Uh, the existing encroachment at 11290 does not currently affect any district utilities. The encroachment does limit the area of gravel shoulder typically available for public use. Uh, the pre-existing wall was located under the vegetative area squared in red. The house at 11290 was built at such an elevation that a driveway would not be able to meet the current highway access driveway, by driveway bylaw standard. In May, the owner was found to be altering the existing wood wall in the district road dedication without permits. The district highways and boulevard policy states permanent structures such as retaining walls and are prohibited in the boulevard or road dedication. Uh, so district staff immediately ordered the work to cease until given direction from council. So the notable areas of encroachment are the three meter wood retaining wall, which is now dismantled, and the Alto utility water main displayed on the in the photo on the right. Alto utility has been made aware of the uncovered water main and will work with the owner on constructing a suitable wall in this location. The uh, question posed to Council is, do we wish to permit the unauthorized encroachment of the retaining wall in the district road dedication at Dar on Darlene Road? Option A would be prior to proceeding with the construction with construction, the applicant be required to register a crossing agreement on title. Option B would be that the owner be permitted to construct the wall uh, without entering to a crossing agreement. And option C would be that the owner be or ordered to remove the encroachments in the district road dedication. Do you have any questions? Councillor Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Microphone. I think Mike, the person. Um, yeah, no question. The uh, Alto Utility water pipe there. So Alto Utilities is going to work with them to rebuild that wall. That. As I understand it, as what you said. So, my question would be if that was our water line, 
what would we be doing? Because that will be our waterline one day. So if that was our waterline, I imagine that we would be working to immediately cover that water main, but it's hard for me to uh, speak for our operations staff, uh, such as Scott Unser. Perhaps maybe Scott would be better off to answer that question. You available? Oh, oh he's, he's in the he's in the hills. Again. He's, in, he's about to watch the, the volcano. There. He's hunting. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So through the chair, um, so the. The owner will be working with Alto and they're talking about a grade beam to to bridge the gap over the the um, over the water line to make sure that the wall doesn't bear on it at all. Um, and then they'll be insulating it to make sure that it's got frost protection. So if it was in our if that was our water main, we'd be doing exactly the same thing. So so Alto's um, got an engineer involved um, to make sure that whatever solution works out, um, they're happy with. Okay, thank you. I'll move off today. Second. Okay, and uh, Council Gambo wants to speak. Um, uh, proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a question then uh, is regarding the uh, potential for a sidewalk. I don't know if it would be that side, but um, you know, if we have a crossing agreement, um, what would we do? Should we need some of the road right of way? So I've, I'm on Google, my own Google Street View right now. Uh, the west side of Darlene, which is this house, uh, multiple residents have these driveways which slope downwards uh, to access these houses. So if a sidewalk were to be installed, it would be installed on the uphill side yeah, on the uphill. east. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And I think at the uh, where where we go to access uh, Peter Greer School, I believe that there is. A sidewalk constructed on the east side, I believe. Yes. Well, it's kind of a sidewalk. <laughs> kind of a sidewalk. <laughs> yes. Okay, Thanks. Get the bike lane on the right, on the left side. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so um, this one here, the uh, water line being so shallow, is kind of a little bit of a concern to me. I don't. I've never seen one sit that close. I just uh, it does. Seen too many private ones. Right? Yeah, it seems weird, eh? So <laughs> they obviously didn't do a very good job there. Even in the picture, it looks like the uh, pipe is cracked on the left end. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm sure they will double check that. Um, if we're taking over a number of these things like this, I would imagine we're going to be picking up some problems. So yeah, so it was offered, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure as long as we didn't do this right and make sure that's insulated, that'd be my concern, but uh, I'm all good with this. Okay, so the motion all is option A. Yeah. All in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Um, yeah, all told utility was sold and we offered to buy it, but... Uh, We've had a couple opportunities. Yeah, but, some we turned down, some but, the owners turned us down. Yeah. Uh, Bylaw notice enforcement. Um, who's doing that? Option A. If council wishes, option A. This is just an update to make sure that our ticketing bylaw is in line with our new development approval procedures bylaw. Good. Councillor Gamble and Councillor Scarrow, those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And the uh, Agricultural Advisory Committee minutes, we don't need those. Information. We've already dealt with that. Uh, Councillor Ryder. Notice of motion, sir. Oh, yeah, Councillor Scarrow. You had a notice. I believe notice of motion comes before. Can I just ask? For a point of clarification on the Lake Stone Master Plan, because it's sent, it said that it's presented here for initial consideration. I just wondered whether we could get some idea as to the next stages of process and when that, how that will be managed. For information. For it's for for cons initial consideration prior to adoption. 
Where are you reading that? In the executive summary. Where? In the executive summary of the report. Page, oh. paragraph two. Yeah. But maybe it looks like Corey's able to speak to that. I just wanted to just know the next steps. Yeah, I, but I thought it was just for information. That's what I thought, but then I read that. Yeah. Well, right. clarify that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I can clarify that. Um, our intention uh, is that it, it eventually the document would be uh, accepted and adopted um, by Council just as the original uh, plan was in previous years. Um, I do have a brief presentation if you're interested. We can do it this evening or another date, but essentially um, the intent was to provide an introduction to the Lake Stone Master Plan update in a public forum, um, basically bringing forward it, the content as it is now with the understanding that there will be further discussion and a response to comment uh, prior to um, a request for you to adopt it. But we're putting it uh, on council's table, if you will, for discussion. Well, it's back to staff for before it comes well, back to council. Okay. Okay. Pardon? As, it, as it is today before we yeah. yeah. Councillor Gamble. Thank you. Uh, just just a comment. Um, I think this is an important document and I, I do think it merits more time than just you know, yeah. sort of an addition to the end of the meeting. Uh, and we've had a very full agenda. It's 20 after 10. I'm wondering if we could defer that to um, the, the soonest meeting that we can, not to say that that will, yeah. you know, that we can actually fit it in. Well, we we did that with when we dealt with the uh, Issue of the variant. Uh, no, the, the no, the no, 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 no. This no, is the no, this full, is different. This is for this is the full master plan, and I, for one, have some questions yeah. about oh, okay. Highland South. Yeah. I Thank see uh, that is identified there, but I'm not clear what that represents exactly, what density and so on. Okay. Uh, there is the OK Center Plateau, okay. and I don't well, believe that's part of it, but it may be. There's Chase Residential. So those are different questions that I think we need to discuss. Yeah. Uh, this is part of the updated master plan. So I'm just yeah. requesting that it come back to council. Yeah, yeah. that's discussion. what it's about. Council so what I would propose is that this actually come to a special council so that we can devote mm -hmm. the time just to going to through this document alone. Great. I don't think this belongs at a regular council meeting. Yeah. It's That's much fine. too big and much too important to the community yeah. to have that kind of discussion. So uh, that's what I would like to see uh, come to a special council meeting. That, yeah, uh, do you need a I motion? I second that if there was a motion. Uh, we'll You're, take you advice from Raina. Yeah. yeah, I'd recommend a motion okay. that it's clearly outlined okay. in the minutes. Okay. Councilor Ireland, um, Councilor Reed, those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Good. Then Corey can present in her full glory. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Now we get down to councillor items. All right, you guys. Um, I provided a notice of motion at the very last minute of the eleven o'clock hour last week. The notice of motion, uh, I believe all of us, and I know Penny for sure, has received input from different community members. Many, in my case, I counted twelve different ones that I could think of off the top of my head that had um, detrimental or concerns about what we're doing with the Pelm Wash in particular um, uh, parkway. On the other hand, I've had hundreds of positive comments. So we're talking about a few people that think maybe we should, as a district, consider asking our staff to prepare some sort of a report on how it is we could revisit the existing plan which was i think built six years ago or or in that range and understand whether or not the evolving uses may have changed whether or not safety issues have shown up 
that that would include truck routes and whether they could be seasonal or not seasonal on on the Pelmarsh Parkway. It includes a whole bunch of things, but I I concern myself with staff time, and I concern myself with council priorities. So I'm not out here trying to get this started and going. I'm out here asking the rest of my peers whether or not they have heard the same sorts of things from their community. And um, if that is the case, maybe we should then ask staff to design a time frame and a plan for reconnecting with the stakeholders and the general public and staff on the uses and the safety of the Pelmosh Parkway. And that would be my, what I would want you to guys to consider. Well, um, everything I've heard had to do with unsafe speed and uh, um, if we and do it as a recreation area, post it at 30 Ks and enforce 30 Ks and that takes care of a lot of the problem. But, uh, uh, Sir, that's not the only issue that's been raised to me. There's been several issues as far as uh, dividing the multi um, use lane, uh, more cement barriers in some of the more uh, scary parts of it. Um, the potential for other uses uh, such as rock climbing has come to my attention. And of course, trucks and trucks and trucks. Yeah, yeah. but <clears throat> mostly doing with public safety on a mixed uh, use corridor. And the speed is the issue whether they're e-bikes e -bike, uh, or motorcycles or uh, trucks and, and cars. But I'm not sure about redesigning the whole thing, but uh, enforcing a slower speed and make it more as a recreational court. Councilor Arna. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the concerns that I hear are speed and trucks, yeah. and trucks and speeds and speed and trucks, and trucks and speeds. Um, however, we've got a set of council priorities and we have a lot of stuff to get done. And I would suggest that we don't throw this away, that we put this on a list and then when we review our council priorities, we decide where this could slot into. Mm -hmm. Because we've, you know, we spent a lot of time building this. We consulted, we spent a lot of time consulting on this. We've adjusted it a couple of times. We had a major rock fall, which is absolutely nobody's fault. Um, and totally unpredictable, but um, yeah, it, it's not time to redesign it. And we have, you know, I, I'm not saying that we should throw this away. I, I would dearly love to find a way to move the trucks, um, but um, I think that it, it just needs to be down. a. I'm just. I'd like to just rebut that a second. I'm not so talking maybe about. Maybe the rest of us could have an opportunity. I'm not talking speak. about redesigning the road. <laughs> I'm talking about reconnecting with the people who use it to find out if their vision matches or aligns yeah. with ours. Well, it's but difficult it's for unless we do a mail-in survey or a email. I did have Council, my hand. Councilor Gamble, you want to call? Thank you. I did have my hand up earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, and uh, I'm behind the map. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I just want to say that yes, I have had concerns raised yeah. about the truck traffic on yeah. Palma Wash, um, but I also have heard concerns from staff about where we would put that truck traffic, um, and so that's an issue as well. We do have business in our community, which I hope we would want to support. And, and as far as speed, yes, I think that is an issue. And I think that is where we might want to have maybe more frequent meetings with our police to <coughs> let them know that this is an area where we want better surveillance because we do need it. Mm -hmm. I think that would solve a lot of the issues if we had the police out there. I mean, they were on Highway 97 um, just, uh, you know, uh, the four uh, lodge there and they were nabbing I don't know how many people because there's so few people there that understand that when you come off that hillside from Oyama that actually we do have a community here and you're supposed to slow down to 70k you're trying to try to get to the school along that road and it's just dangerous because people are going but they could also go along Palma Wash and uh, 
I think yeah. that would be very helpful. I, I I appreciate the motion coming forward, but I, I think if we, you know, maybe discuss this as one of the issues at a as strategy a session. Strategy and prior, prioritization. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I agree with because you. staff is, is pretty busy I right now. I just want to bring it over the table. Yeah. And no, you. I've had issues brought to me, not just that, yeah, also I'm fishing. Sure. Fishing is an issue. By any means. But I'm not talking redesign. I'm talking about No, I know what you mean. But Okay. Well, you got, uh, you I got, yeah. what, what yeah. Councillor Reed. Um, Councillor Reed got the call. I also think Councillor Kozab was trying to speak as well. Um, I, I would suggest maybe um, we ask staff about what would be the best way to engage with the community if when if maybe we discuss a set of strategy and we set out some objectives for what we're looking for out of this meeting and then ask staff to design the best method to engage and get those results because I think there is there are ways potentially we subject to staff time obviously there are ways in which we could start to gather some of this information and continue to engage with the community over the summer because this is a hot topic and uh, I think if we leave it to the strategic priorities meeting, which normally happens in this in November, that might not be the right approach. And I think if we can find a way to move at least some aspects of this forward during the summer, I think that would be a good thing. OK, thank you. Um, you're up there, Councillor Ryder. Yeah, well, I was going to get to Jeremy. He wants to speak on this. Oh, speak about this. this. Well, Jeremy. I didn't, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't want to speak on this. I have my own opinion, but I'll wait until the meeting, right? That if we're going to go that route, because there's no point in me talking now if we're going to move it forward. Uh, yeah, just some of the, I have grave concerns over it too. But uh, yeah, this isn't the avenue for it, I don't think, unless you guys want to hear me rant. I'm not sure I got all of that, but. I don't want to hear rant. No, <laughs> no. Okay. I don't no. want to hear myself rant either. Mayor Baker? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to just speak to uh, Councillor Reed's point about this coming forward. I would suggest Council has a lot of things to cover in strategy sessions between now and summer break. Mm -hmm. And like to the point of which we've already got pretty much every Tuesday wrapped up with the exception of next Tuesday and staff could not be ready to present on this next Tuesday. So um, I'm not convinced that there would be time between now and summer break to get this done. Um, I do think that given the amount of um, effort and time and consideration that it needs, that it is best to go to strategy, strategic priorities for consideration in conjunction with all the other projects that are ongoing. OK, thank you. Anyway, Councillor Ryden, so we got Councillor no Carroll, Councillor Arden. Um, no, you know, the only thing I, uh, I've been reflecting on all night is, is what happened in Kamloops and uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I hope that the people that are struggling with this and, you know, there'll be many people that are struggling with this information. I mean, uh, I'm struggling with it sometimes. <laughs> um, are reaching out, you know, there's been many, uh, you know, I don't know the numbers myself, but there's many numbers that are up there that you can call to uh, to get some help. So. And that uh, you know that going forward, that I hope we really do something meaningful to uh, to uh, going around help, the, uh, help the situation. Going around the table, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I echo those last comments. Um, I uh, um, found out um, later in life that uh, our family had First Nations in us, and. Um, my grandma, who is very smart, uh, hid it from the family, and uh, I found that very interesting. And, uh, you know, when you can see what goes on with the racism and so on, you see probably why she did it well, way back when. So uh, uh, um, my thoughts are with them as well. And, uh, you know, it's my worst nightmare to uh, have attend uh, my, one of my kids' funerals. It would be a worse nightmare to not know what happened to your kid. So um, that that's an atrocity for sure. Um, it would be really nice if uh, we as a council would get together with their council and see if there's something we can do. I d definitely agree with that, that we said off the bat. So um, words to me don't mean very much. Um, actions do, so I I'm, would support that. 
Um, so yeah, uh, um, to get to PEMWASH, I agree it's uh, later in the summer thing. It's probably best after after we've went through it again here, um, but it does require its own thing, I'm sure. I definitely get a lot of uh, complaints on my end from it as well. Um, so what um, uh, I would comment as uh, far as the police go in uh, out in Oyama, I have seen the police more often out there than I have, uh, I would say, in years. And uh, I've stopped and talked to them and they're parked in the shade by the school, you know, monitoring and of course the the worst offenders, the big trucks that fly through there. One gets on to the radio and radios the scale shack at Pier Mac and then they all come through nice and slow <laughs> while he's sitting there. Um, so it helps for a little while, but uh, they definitely, to me, are the worst offenders, right? Because uh, you're not going to stop a full loaded truck if a kid runs out on the road chasing a ball. So. Yeah. I look forward to those changes that we have for that area. Um, I would also suggest now that parking, I was very surprised at the parking today was piling up along the Ismith. I, I would like to see us extend the parking up the old highway um, to where we have it uh, across from Gatsky's there. That gets filled up on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Usually the only spot that's empty is the handicap spot. So I, I would really push for us uh, if we've got some budgeting room to uh, extend that farther up the road and give uh, give um, some proper parking in uh, in a place that doesn't cause any problems and we already own the land. So I would suggest that would be one uh, that I would support 100 percent. So and uh, some signage on it. Yes, and the only other thing is, um, uh, you know, obviously with that many people at the lake, uh, it appears like our little algae problem has subsided and I only see little bits of it here and there. So a little bit of rain and the wind seems to have helped. So all, all else is good. Good. Yeah. Councilor Koza, are you still there? Oh, I, I got a list here. There I am. <laughs> no, I have, I have nothing to add except for, uh, yeah, Pebble Wash. Uh, I just sure wish we could uh, stop the, the large tractor trailers, the 53 footers from going down there. A truck and pop gravel truck that's working locally is one thing, but a guy going from Vancouver to Calgary, I don't see how he would need to have to drive down that with a 53 foot trailer, especially with those corners. So I would like to see us putting a weight restriction on it and or like so that we can have the uh, truck and pops, but not the big, big guys. That would be my take on it, but uh, that's for a further date. I have yeah. nothing as yeah. far as the council. Should, right should be doable. Good. Thanks, Councillor and Councillor Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would echo the comments of my fellow councillors and our mayor today about the residential schools and uh, speaking as a Catholic, I think I can say that here. Um, I hope there will be accountability and action on all parties um, and uh, that uh, we can move forward and uh, with love and hope in our hearts that this will never ever happen again and uh, healing for all of those concerned. Um, other items in my local area, um, uh, Gable Beach, uh, we had a Friends of Gable Beach cleanup. Thank you to everyone who turned up. You know who you are. Uh, we cleaned up Gable Beach we and the surrounding roads. I have to say they were pretty immaculate. Uh, we have a really good tribe of people out there who uh, regularly walk and pick up litter as they go. And uh, it, it was impressively clean. Um, however, the one disappointing one was the amount of cigarette butts that were found. Um, we are in a super dry situation here um, and we would plead with everyone, be they a visitor, um, a local or a contractor who's working um, at, at one of the many um, we have under construction at the moment to please just uh, watch the cigarette butts going on to the grass verges. Um, it's super dry um, and we just don't want to trouble our firefighters. 
to come out. Um, and also a thank you to those who helped with the construction of the Coral Beach to Mackie Road trail handrail. Uh, if anybody wants to see a really beautiful looking handrail, words that I did not think I would be using, um, that's the place to go. It is absolutely stunning, <coughs> looks fantastic and eminently practical. So thank you to uh, Marie Malloy and the uh, Access and Age Friendly uh, Committee, um, the uh, Community Association who lent their support to that and also to the, all of the staff involved, both on a kind of a planning level and on the implementation side. A really, really successful project and just complements the work that's been done at Gable Beach North. So looking forward to more of them in the area. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Gamble. Thank you. I would like to uh, just uh, give a little thank you to the planning staff. I think they did an excellent job tonight. And in the last while, I just feel that they have moved to quite a high level of, of uh, professionalism. And, and I'm really impressed. Um, just the, the way things are being presented to us uh, and even just the new staff that have come on. Uh, really thorough and uh, and give a, a, a very clear, concise presentation. Um, they do challenge us, I think, to make our own decisions a lot more than we used to. Uh, and I must say, I'm I'm totally impressed. I think uh, good job. And uh, I have to pass that on to our engineering as well. Difficult decisions, different difficult uh, discussions. But uh, that's what we look to staff for. We look to staff for their expertise and their advice. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks to them. Thank you. And um, I wanted to comment as oh, well. <laughs> uh, just uh, well, reiterating our, our sympathy uh, for uh, all of the families that were affected by uh, the uh, uh, discovery of 215 interments. Uh, today's um, technology with uh, DNA uh, could find the lost children of the families that then Ancestry uh, will give them their DNA and certainly I, I understand from the news it's been treated as a crime scene so forensics will be done and DNA will be done and uh, they may actually and uh, because the whole of Thompson Okanagan and even some of the caribou uh, children attended that school so I know some from the area that I am from at Lytton and Merritt and Nicola that uh, went to the residential school in that. and it wasn't just Catholic the Lytton residential school was uh, Anglican uh, or Protestant, uh, the um, United uh, Church schools uh, uh, w were not dissimilar, and the federal government is ultimately to blame who uh, turned over the education of the savages, as they called them, to uh, the churches as they, they were those days. And uh, so we're talking in the uh, 18th uh, 76 with the advent of the Indian Act that uh, uh, led to that type of behavior. And we certainly hope that we've done away with that type of behavior, uh, but uh, racism is still there and discrimination still occurs. But um, things are certainly improving. When I started teaching at post-secondary level, there were 12 Native students and all of post-secondary and BC. Now um, UBC has native instructors and uh, just UBC Okanagan has uh, scads of uh, First Nations people, but the difference has been the education and, and, the, uh, and the parents being able to send their children to school and know they will see them again. But so anyway, that's my rant for tonight, Jeremy. So <laughs> well, um, we are adjourned.